Okay, it is um, May 10th, 2022. I call this meeting the Wall Fleet Select, or May 10th, 2022 at 7.02 p.m. I call this meeting the Wall Fleet Select Board to order in accordance with the temporary suspension and enhancement of the open meeting laws allowed by the General Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, the first item on our agenda is announcements, open session, public comments. Um, please note that public comments um, must be brief and the board will not deliberate or vote on any matter raised solely during announcements and public comments. Uh, Chief Hurley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody. Just two quick items. Number one, you've probably seen either on social media or uh, out on Route 6, we are having this Sunday, May 15th, a touch a truck event from 10 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. co-sponsored with uh, the East Ham Police Department. And by all signs, it's going to be a rather large event. It's open to everybody, free admission. So I'd like to invite the, the community in the Lower Cape to it. Uh, the second quick announcement is I'm hoping this week our draft version of our hazard mitigation plan is turning third base and we can get a uh, over to the finish line with it due to um, tremendous amount of work by the emergency management team, along with um, Martha at the Cape Cod Commission, who we've contracted with to help us. It's about a 160 page document, but critical to uh, projects and grants and environmental uh, issues moving forward. So you, you may see that by the end of the week, either online or through committees, um, but we'll have a uh, open uh, period for comment on it, along with, I believe, working with the chair to get on the next uh, select board meeting just as an agenda item for any uh, wrap up public comment. So thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so um, annual board reorganization. Um, so we have to elect officers, um, but um, John? Yes, I'd like to move that we postpone the re reorganization to the uh, first meeting after the June 21st election for the reason that we need to have the board that's going to be going forward for the next three years rather than the next six weeks uh, to, to perform this reorganization. I think that's the only appropriate and fair way to do it. Okay, um, is there a second or a Helen? Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. And also um, that we do it by before that meeting. Well, I won't be on the board, but I suggest that the board might wanna, everybody might wanna say what they're willing to do or not to do, not just to have you know nominations coming out of the blue. Thank you, but I won't be here then. Thank you. Okay, so do you second John Mos John? Yes, okay. Is there any additional discussion? Fine with that. Okay. Um, so can I have a roll call vote? Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. John. I already voted. I voted aye. Oh, oh, we didn't hear you. Yeah, I didn't hear you. I didn't what, hear you. Didn't? No. Okay. Are, am I coming through okay? No, no you are. are. Okay, uh, Ryan? Yep. Was that I? <laughs> I haven't voted. So Ryan, I. Helen, I. Thank you. Okay. Um, and actually, I, I should have done this first. So I wanted to welcome uh, Barbara Carboni uh, to the board. Um, I, I definitely look forward to working with you. Um, and very excited to have uh, somebody with your background on the board. Um, and I also wanted uh, to give you an opportunity mm -hmm. if, you, if you wanted to, to speak um, to the public. I know that your first meeting was actually last or Friday, mm -hmm. but you know, this one's a, a few more people. So mm -hmm. thank you. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I look forward to working with you and the other board members um, as, as well. I uh, feel really privileged to be on the board and I just hope that I can um, uh, just put the experience that I have um, to some good use here. And um, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because we have a long meeting ahead of us. Thank you. Well, thank you. 
Um, so on to the uh, police officer reappointments. Um, so yeah, I, I moved to re reappoint or I moved to approve the reappointment of the following full-time police officers from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023. Uh, Sarah Chase, Christopher Green, Nicholas Daly, Edward uh, Garneau, uh, Jeremy uh, v Val? V Valley. Valley. Uh, Eric Daly, uh, Michael a Allen, uh, Matthew McHugh, um, is there a um, second? One second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Anna, aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Ryan, aye. Helen, aye. Okay, and then I move to approve the uh, reappointment of the following special uh, police officers from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023. Uh, Mark, Mark Spiegel, uh, Desmond, Keo, sorry, I'm just I'm gonna have one of those nights. And Ronald L. Fassett. Okay. okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. John, I. Barbara, I. Michael, I. Ryan, I. Helen, I. Okay. Mush carries five zero. Um, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. The Thank you, Chief, and, and thank you for all the officers and, and all the work that they've been doing. Um, so uh, goal setting for the incoming town administrator. I, I'm not, in, so I put this on the agenda. Um, my, my intention is to have it, or basically present the town, the incoming town administrator with um, what our goals are for him. Um, in the first meeting uh, where, where he is, I would say, in his first official meeting, which would be um, the first meeting in June. Um, but I wanted to um, get the board thinking about it um, and to, uh, you know, have them have board members start formulating what their goals might be for the, for the town administrator. I would recommend, um, you know, what are your goals in the first three months, six months, and a year? Um, just to give him a, a overview of, of where the board is on different issues. Um, Helen? Yeah, well, we already have goals that we established and, you know, whether we have a new town administrator or not, they are still in place, in my opinion. Uh, they're so good, we could do it again. But I think the main goal would be to ask the new town administrator to focus on getting up to speed with all our various regulations, bylaws, policies, and related information. And there's a lot, you know, our personnel bylaw and so forth. And that in and of itself, his good relationship with all those structures is one of the most important things for a town administrator to get under his or her belt in the first six months, particularly. Thank you. Okay, so typically, the board sets its goals after the annual election. I know. Um, and we need to start getting back to that schedule. Um, you know, we set our goals late the, the previous two years because of, you know, the circumstances we were in. Um, but yeah, I, I think with the start of the new town administrator, I mean, we the there's been a number of goals that have been accomplished that were in our goals. Um, and some are ongoing. Um, so I, I just want the board to, to start considering what their goals are with the, and be ready for them um, in the first meeting in June. So are there any other uh, questions? Okay, uh, seeing none. Um, so to the consent agenda. Um, so I move to adopt, adopt the consent agenda as drafted. One second. second, but unless there's somebody who doesn't want something. Yep. Uh, yeah, so if, if there's an objection to any of the items on the, the consent agenda, um, all you have to do is ask for them to be removed from the consent agenda and they will be discussed separately. Um, but seeing none, can I have a roll call vote? Not I. 
Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Brian, aye. Helen, aye. Okay, motion carries 5 0. Um, and that's for the Grace Chapel and Neil Nichols. Um, so uh, to the Chamber of Commerce for the 4th of July parade. Uh, Lara? Sorry. Give her a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she should be good. Rebecca Eldridge, uh, through you, Ryan. Rebecca Eldridge, you have outdone yourself. Thank you. I love the visuals. That's what I'm talking about. It makes it fun for you guys. Namaste. Absolutely. All right. Um, so thanks for your time this evening. Um, the chamber would like to host the 4th of July parade this year. Very similar, if not the exact same way that we've done it in the past. And we're requesting the same services um, from um, police and fire and the DPW. Um, and we're looking forward um, to, to trying to, to go back to, to what we've done in the past. I, I know that a lot of people are looking forward to having a 4th of July parade again, um, but uh, Helen? Yeah, just uh, what we always do with events. Can we just add to the motion along the route usually established for the 4th of July parade? Because remember, we're giving you permission to use the town ways and it's a sort of insurance protection thing. Thank you. So whoever makes the motion, I guess maybe that should be me. With this okay. Um, Mike? Just happy to uh, see this come before us again. <laughs> happy to support that. Thank you, Lara doing all the work they've been doing on the chamber. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just know that a lot of people are really, yeah, will be really excited. So, uh, Helen, if you would care to advance the motion. I move to approve the 4th of July parade to be held around Wellfleet, to be held along townways in Wellfleet along the usual route that the parade takes on Monday, July 4th, 2022, from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., all town property that is used for this event shall be returned to pre-parade conditions to the satisfaction of the DPW director, following and that all department recommendations shall be followed. Michael, second. Okay, can I have a roll call vote? Aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Brian, aye. Oh, and I thank you. I'm so looking forward to it. All right. um, Frank, I know you're here for the Grace Chapel. Um, we did grant your, your use of town property already. So just, just so you're aware. So, um, okay. Uh, Rebecca Arnoldi, um, various locations um, for yoga and walking, nature hikes. Um, Rebecca? Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, so um, your, your application is not really very clear um, to the extent of the use or, or what's happening where. Um, and I know that some town staff has concerns um, that they would like addressed. Um, so right now I'm recommending that it, it get be referred um, to the town staff for you to work work with um, to define the um, the application a little bit better so that we have a better understanding of what's taking place. Are you amenable to that? Yes. Okay. Um, is there any discussion from the members of the board? Okay. Um, so seeing none. So I move to refer the use of town property application. Um, filed by Rebecca Arnoldi and the applicant to the Director of Community Services, the Recreation Director, and the Health and Conservation Agent uh, to define the scope of the request of the East Town property in reasonable terms that, um, and conditions that may be requested by them. Uh, and furthermore, that the applicant should file uh, two separate applications covering the different activities. So one for yoga and one for the nature hikes. Um, Second. Okay, Rebecca. Just a question. Should I contact these folks or will they be contacting me? 
Um, it would be good if you can follow up with them. I would just check in with uh, Rebecca Eldridge after the meeting, send her an email or, or send her an email now um, and um, get you in touch with them um, as soon as possible. So. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so can, is there any other discussion? Okay, can I roll call vote? John, aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Brian, aye. Well, not. Okay. Um, so, um, food truck uh, regular. So, this is actually a public hearing. Um, so, I opened the public hearing on um, to amend Wellfleet's uh, food truck red regulations. Um, or I, I hereby open. Sorry, I don't have my cheat mm -hmm. sheet in front of me. I hereby open the public hearing uh, to amend um, Wellfleet's food truck regulations. Um, so there's an issue with um, the current regulations. They're, they're not um, in line with the zoning. Um, so that's where the language about where food trucks are allowed in town comes from in this draft is um, that's based on what what the zoning is for food trucks. Um, they're included in zoning. Um, and so Rebecca roughly said that this had come up recently, um, basically a conflict between the regs and the zoning. Um, so this is one I originally had drafted for last year. Um, I don't think we ever moved on it as a select board. Um, but it also brings it in line with um, some of the um, bylaws and policies uh, promulgated by the board or um, by the town. So, Helen? Yeah, thank you. I was here the first time we drafted one of these and many other times. So thank you very much for fixing the zoning thing. I remember that. There are some typos in here, which I can just, you know, talk to Rebecca Eldridge about later that don't change the you know, the content. But there's one thing in here that I think shouldn't be in here. So when we were originally doing this, there was an issue with a food truck that was being left on town property overnight. And Harry Dukanian was our town administrator and he went and he did a deep dive into whether or not that was advisable. And I think this may, may have come up the last time we discussed it too. And these regulations, um, allow it, given that the Board of Health approves or an additional fee, except within the National you know, Park District. But my memory is that we shouldn't do it on town-owned property because of insurance issues. Ryan, did you get any oh. further insight on this? Yeah, um, Hillary, um, I, I've asked Hillary to come to this meeting as well. Um, can you unmute her? She's at the very bottom of the list. I'm here. Hello. All right. Hello. Um, hi, Hillary. Um, can you talk about the um, health and safety aspect of food trucks in um, their, I, I don't know, relocating them or not? Sure. So the food code does say that they need to go back to their base of operation. Um, and that's for purposes of receiving products, cleaning and sanitizing the equipment, and dumping wastewater. Um, there have been instances where we've granted a variance, the Board of Health can grant a variance to leave the food trucks on the site, if that's a better setup for doing all of those other sort of ancillary tasks associated with operating the food truck. So it's kind of a case by case basis and that's why we reviewed the application. Ryan? Okay. Um. This had something to do with, this was, the reason not to do it was not because of Hillary's requirements. It was about the insurance of town owned property and its use. And it had nothing, what Hillary said is accurate, right? Totally. But it's not about that. It's about insurance of town owned property. And Charlie, you haven't been here so long, but does that ring a bell with you? No, not at all, sorry. Okay, I think we should either wait. I mean, it's it would be covered under the liability insurance held by the um, by the the user. Um, it's same as any use of town property. 
you know, they have to have a liability policy that covers their operations on town property. Oh, you know what? I think what we did was say, if it's on town owned property, it could be on private property where Hillary's requirements or the Board of Health requirements would still apply. But if it's on town owned property, I think my memory is that they would have to um, uh, not hold us accountable. What's the phrase? Indemnify. Indemnify. Yeah, we had, they'd have to indemnify the uh, town as you know part of their license. Thank you. Or not their license, their use of town property permission. Thank you. Yeah, so we can add that to use of town property. Um, Mike? Yeah, um, I think this is good. And I, I think that that section is important because uh, this did come up last year. The Harbor Master did not want the food truck pulling in and out during peak hours of um, boat traffic and trailering and trying to maneuver the, ve the vehicle through there. Uh, and so the, um, the food truck operator had purchased a parking spot from the marina and paid you know, the same amount that uh, a boat trailer would pay to park in that into a space. And it was actually a space that the town that doesn't, is not actually a parking space anyway. So I think it's important that we have the latitude and that gives us this, but it doesn't, auto, it's not an automatic use that we allow overnight parking. Um, it, it would have to be applied for and approved. So I, I'm, I'm happy with this. Okay. Um, are there any other comments? And I, I would like to also remind that this is a public hearing. So any comments from the public are, would be appropriate as well. Um, okay. So seeing none, um, I move to approve um, the food truck re regulate or Wellfleet's food trucks regulations as drafted. Ellen, second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Ellen, aye. Michael, aye. Barbara, aye. Ryan, aye. Ellen, aye. Okay, so motion carries five zero. Yep. Um, uh, Nancy. Um, can you unmute her, please? Um, so this is the authorization to increase the, um, or increase the spending authorization for the shellfish revolving fund for propagation. Um, Nancy? Yes. Um, so we have uh, two things that have come, uh, opportunities that have come up uh, at uh, annual town meeting it was uh, approved to spend up to $50,000 and we have income into the revolving fund uh, that exceeds that obviously because it's 75% of all um, shellfishing permits that get sold and 75% of all grant revenue. So we're always taking in more than we use, which is the proper way to do things. But when uh, opportunities come our way, what we need to do is go to the select the Shellfish Advisory Board for a recommendation and then come to the Select Board for a decision on whether we could increase that. And this year, as my memo states, we have uh, decided not to buy hatchery seed and to invest in double down on the contaminated Quahog Relay. Uh, that is a state run, tightly managed program. Uh, the Quahogs are, are uh, lightly contaminated and they, uh, the state makes you, the towns, only towns are allowed to do this and towns put them in an area, they have to close it for three months, not because they're that contaminated, but because they need to spawn. And uh, commercial and recreational shell fishermen have let us know that they have seen returns uh, in uh, juvenile shellfish in Chipman's Cove particularly, and we can attribute that to this uh, relay that we're doing. So we had only budgeted for 500 bushels, which is what we did last year, and we would like to increase that to 1,000 bushels. So there's part of the money that we are asking for. And the other is that we are in the final stages of permitting for our coaching program. And therefore, uh, we have some bills that used to be paid out of the town administrator's uh, budget 
but now that we have uh, the revolving fund for propagation, we, and this is obviously for propagation activities, that's all that it can be spent for, the town administrator's budget does not have the cash and we can certainly come to the revolving fund. It is an appropriate expenditure. So that's why we are asking for up to $15,000. Uh, we have one bill uh, uh, to pay and there will be one more before the end of the fiscal year. So we believe that this should cover the additional expenses and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, Mike, you're probably recusing yourself, right? I'm formally recusing myself. Yep. As support. Yeah, I, I have to start writing that down so that I always remember. That's fine. Um, John? I'm just, I'm just curious as to what, what, what is the nature of the contamination? It's fecal coliform. So the state performs water quality and, uh, you know, all of our shellfishing areas are monitored for, for fecal coliform. And if it's above 14 colony forming units, that area must go into the prohibited status. So the Taunton River is in the prohibited status, but they have a wonderful clam resource there. They test the clams for um, things like shellfish diseases and they are disease free and for other things like heavy metals and PCBs and they are uh, free from those substances as well. This is something that like if we had a rain closure here, the state would co close us for two or three days so that any runoff, any septic uh, effluent that came out during a very heavy rainfall, more than four inches in 24 hours, we would get closed and those shellfish would be able to purge in uh, two or three days. And that's the same for these clams, uh, but they make us keep them for three months in order to obtain uh, the spawning potential. Okay. Helen? Yeah, and an another similar thing is the Herring River area, so-called in our shellfish regs, is closed annually and then can only be opened after a water test from the DMF. And that's closed for uh, coliform too, but once it's opened up, the shellfish are fine. It's not a diseased shellfish. It's an area that may have coliform in it, which is why you don't take your dogs around the harbor either. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I move to approve um, and increase and authorize and um, I move to approve uh, an increase uh, not to exceed $15,000. Um, from the Shellfish Revolving Fund per MGL Chapter 44, Section uh, 53E. Uh, is that 12 or 1 2? Um, I'll say 1. I believe it's 1 2. 1 2 uh, for propagation. One second. Okay, roll call vote. John, aye. Deborah, aye. Ryan, I. Okay, motion carries four zero with one recusal. Uh, Thank you. No, you're welcome. Don't go anywhere yet. Um, nope. So, um, a hardship, uh, commercial hardship uh, exemption for Robert Wallace. Nancy? Yes. Uh, so, uh, we received a request, actually, a letter both to the select board and myself. Uh, requesting, so uh, requesting the exemption, so the it, to receive a commercial shellfishing permit. So the town sells commercial permits from December first of the preceding year till January thirty first of the current year, and if you don't get your permit in that time period, you're you don't get it unless you come to the select board to request the exemption. Three different criteria, all three of them need to be met. And so um, Bob Wallace has put forth, and I have included in your packet, uh, my uh, judgment on it. And uh, he included a doctor's note and uh, it's up to you if you desire to grant him the exemption. Uh, but it seems to me that he meets the three exemption criteria. Helen? Having been through a few of these, I believe that he does qualify. And uh, through you to Nancy, Nancy, I don't think Bob Wallace has ever failed to apply for his commercial permit. This was very unusual. 
Yeah, I, I would have to go back and check how many years he's had it. Um, but I he certainly so he certainly uses it, um, you know, if nothing else, sometimes to to put hats in the cove and stuff. I don't know how often he does that, but um, this would be, you know, people can use their commercial shellfish permits in order to collect spat in Chimmins Cove, a wild area. Yes, and I, in fact, asked him about it and, you know, established that this was really unusual for him. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay, uh, so I move to approve uh, the hardship exemption for a commercial shellfishing permit uh, to Robert Wallace. Oh, one second. Okay, roll call vote, please. John, aye. Barbara, aye. Uh, Ryan, aye. Sorry, when Mike's not voting, it throws me off. Oh, and I. So, okay. Okay, thank you. I will let um, I will let Bob know, and uh, he can come in down at the shellfish shack, and and the beach department. I can work with them to get that done. All right, and uh, so Mike, you can rejoin us. Um, so, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so uh, the water uh, FY twenty three um, water enterprise fund budget. Um, can you unmute Jim Hood as well? Um, um, and probably Kurt. Um, so who, who, Jim, should I be calling on you to present or Charlie? Sorry, you're muted, Jim. Give Rebecca a second. He should be good. Yep, you're good now, Jim. Okay. Okay. So, um, the thank you for having us back. I mean, um, I, I think that the budget that we had available to you last week was a bit uh, confusing. So hopefully this one is better. The so it basically shows the operating budget for uh, 2022 and 2023. Um, the um, it's essentially the same as what we've had in prior years. I just want to make a couple of remarks about it. Um, the uh, water system operators contract, which is a second item on here, which is the white water service contract. It shows that uh, it's 85,000 for this year. And last year it was 138,750. The difference here is uh, essentially that we've removed the contractual services, the other contingency fund contractual services associated with that out of the base fee. So the base contract is for 85,000. The next line uh, is the um, uh, contingency fund associated with that and for emergency services. Then following that, the next line is $5,000 is essentially small contracts, maintenance on the water tower, uh, um, the uh, service on the generator at the Boy Scout Camp Well site. Um, and then repairs and maintenance on the system um, was also taken out of the uh, white water systems contract and uh, on a separate line so that we're able to identify those expenses um, separately. Um, and going on down, the, the rest of it is essentially the same as from prior years. Um, and uh, the one thing that we have in there, so just to clarify is that for postage, uh, we're talking about cost of postage for um, uh, uh, billings um, sub or that are required for uh, customers who are on a deferred payment plan and also delin uh, delinquent billing notices. So that's what that is in there. So the total operating expenses uh, uh, for the coming year would be $186,087. And of that, we're projecting uh, operating revenues of 145,000, and that would be from usage fees and base service fees from, from customers on the system. And that would result in um, um, a deficit of 41,087 that we would ask be made up from general fund contribution. So that is the operating budget. Um, on, below the line there, you will see uh, the um, cost associated with the debt service for the water system. We have not presented it this way in the past, but 
we are asking you to take a look at it this way this year and that it's there's there are three loans the usda loan that was associated with the uh back it that was instant initiated in may of 2010 uh, when the water tower was installed that uh, that loan was for 1.5 million and the principal and interest on that for the current year or for the coming year would be 59,415. The second loan was also a USDA loan and that was initiated in August of 15 and that was for a million dollars and the principal and interest associated with that are $48,206 for that loan. And the final one is a general obligation bond that was that's associated with the the, the current um, work that's going on to install the new water main from the Coles Neck Wellfield down into town along um, Route 6 and Briar Lane. And the, the value of that loan is $1.235 million. Um, and principal and interest on that total are $101,900. So the total debt service for 2023 associated with the water system is $209,000. $521. And we have um, connection fees from customers and deferred payments from customers totaling $84,365. Uh, and interest payments of $2,060 for a total of revenues for debt service, specifically for debt service, of $86,425 leaving at, um, a deficit of 123,096. Uh, I, I uh, call your attention to this because as part of our um, work with the consultant, Doug Gardner of Pioneer Consulting, uh, we recognize that the, those fees that we in the past had assumed could be used for anything, those connection fees or deferred payment fees um, are, are, are restricted by regulation. To, to only being used for repayment of debt. So that's why they're uh, below the line here is a separate, uh, in a separate area. Um, I don't know if, if Kurt, have you anything else to add to this? Oh, I think that's perfect, Jim. Okay. Uh, Charlie, do you have anything? Um, I uh, simply want to say that um, uh, that I wanted to uh, thank the water commissioners. You know, we've worked, you know, collaboratively all winter long. And um, I think that um, they've come up with a responsible budget and um, addressed a number of problems the town has been facing in, in a really reasonable manner. So, yeah, I'm really satisfied. And I want to thank uh, Jim and Kurt in particular for their, their efforts. Okay. Uh, I have a quick question um, uh, for Jim or Kurt. Um, when when does the um, the new rate structure? When would that take effect? Our our goal um, our goal on that Ryan would be to um, implement it July first. Uh, we had a, a very good meeting uh, this afternoon where we made some progress on establishing the new well agreeing to the new rate structure and, and recommending that um, we're also working on the connection fee issue as well as some other issues um, but within our probably our next meeting or so we would have a full recommendation on the new rate structure uh, within with an eye toward establishing a public hearing on that which is required and uh, ideally having the rate structure take effective July 1st. Okay um, and Charlie, how would that, or how would the uh, FY23 budget take that new structure into account? Would you be able to? Yeah, I've already actually, you know, frankly, assumed that in the forecast plan. I had, I had to project and plan something, and I had reason to be op optimistic. Um, so that's what I've included in the current uh, forecast. Okay, um, Mike. Sorry, can he's muted. Rebecca, can you? <laughs> oh, uh, Kurt, Ryan, could I just say one thing? Yep. Yeah, and um, Jim and Kurt, I, I believe the um, 
those uh, fees that you talked about could also be used for special capital projects for the water department as well. Yes, that's true. Okay, not just debt. So I just, not a fine point, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, Mike? Yeah, I was just wondering if we have any idea of how many people are uh, on uh, new town water routes uh, and if there's any idea of like what the impact on the budget would be should there be some goal set in um, in how many people connect over the next certain amount of years and how that would affect the budget or at least some analysis on that um, as far as um, the overall general fund contribution. Like, it seems like we need to get more people on the system and the connection fee is pretty high. And I'm just wondering if there's any sort of uh, conversation about about those issues. Going sure. Um, yeah, I can take that. Uh, it's, it's a great point. Uh, and actually, what our discussion this afternoon really had to do with um, significantly reducing the connection fee and putting it in line with, with other communities. I think we presented information to the board uh, at our la the last time we met together, showing that Wellfleet was significantly higher than most of the other communities. Um, we, voted, uh, we voted to reduce it to about $750. Uh, which would uh, significantly encourage people to connect. Uh, we have done some analysis looking at, there are several customers that have approached the, the uh, board uh, to potentially connect, including uh, Harborside Village, um, ultimately uh, 95 Lawrence Road. Um, so those are, those are potentially some significant, large new users to the system. Uh, along the new water main, there are a number of businesses that could connect uh, and you know, it's it's our it's our our desire as a board to see a significant number of customers um, connect, uh, and that would significantly change the financial picture. So, uh, between increasing rates, uh, reducing the connection fees, um, we can't predict, uh, Mike, right now how that will impact future customers connecting, um, but we believe it's going to have a, a significant impact. Um, Mike? No, I, I'm, I'm good. All right. Um, I have a quick question that I'll call on Helen. Um, for a median single family house, um, what is the, the revenue annually um, from, from a median single family house? I think we're at about $350. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Helen? Yeah. Um some estimate about uh, projected future connections is useful. The other thing that's useful, using a model that was provided to us by the USDA some time ago by John Masterson and a couple of other people, um, I think that uh, the water commissioners should definitely assess the impact on our aquifer lenses. Um, and the model's very good. They you know, did a whole seminar on it. And it's there for our use. I don't know that it's ever been used. And since we're talking about financial impact of added users, right? Having that estimated in relation to future costs having to do with expanding the water system to provide for you know, added users, although right now in the immediate present, we can get away with it, would be very good particularly because the model's already been created. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments by the board? I did have one more, yep. uh, sorry. Uh, do we know how much longer we have on these debt service uh, obligations, like uh, the, the uh, 2010 debt, the 2010? 2010 and the 2015 um, were both 40 year loans. Okay. Okay. The, uh, the, uh, the, the other one, the general obligation bond, which was taken out a, uh, in, 20, in 2021, I believe is a 20 year loan. Okay. Uh, anything else, Mike? No, that's it. Okay. Um, Judah? Darren? 
Hi, thank you, Chair. I have two questions. Um, you said the medium was $350 a year. And how many gallons is that for, or is it unlimited? Uh, Kurt, Jim? Yeah, that's the, it's typically about 20,000 gallons a year. 20,000 in six months, Kurt. I'm sorry, yeah, 20,000 in six months, 40,000 a year is what the, the median is typically uh, oh, using. Sorry. sorry, that was like a one bedroom or a single family of four people or something? Um, the median residential house, single family house. Okay, and so that's 40,000 gallons a year. And then you said the connectivity was reduced to 750. What was it before? We've had a connection fee of, of six thousand dollars, and we've spent a we spent about the last couple of years discussing how we might adjust that or or look at that. Um, a typical well in the town of Wellfleet uh, costs probably between um, you know let's just say three thousand to six thousand dollars. That's the typical cost of a well on average, and with a connection fee of about $6,000, it really, it didn't make sense for customers in general to want to connect to the water system. So that's something we've been looking at very closely. Uh, we did an analysis that we presented to the Board of Selectmen last time, which showed that Wellfleet was significantly off the charts in terms of its overall connection fee compared to other communities. Some communities um, are at zero for a connection fee. Other communities are actually even uh, subsidizing through the DPW, connecting customers directly to the water system at no cost. Uh, so in, in light of looking at Wellfleet's uh, rate of connections at about 10% of the people who currently um, have the water line passing in front of their home being connected, uh, we obviously have, a pro have had a problem in Wellfleet uh, in terms of trying to get a, a more financially um, sustainable model going forward. So that's a long, long answer to your question, but basically that we, we really believe that we've, we've taken some significant action uh, to try to put the, put the uh, financial model in, a, in, in the path of sustainability and, and supportability and reduce the draw from the, from the uh, town general fund to continue to pay for the water system. Okay. So, um, geez, sorry. Does that answer your question? Um, Mostly, I just, I think, following up on what Michael DeVasto said, that there's a plan for how many people ultimately, you know, would be on the system and that we have enough water, you know, for all those people. Um, and just as an aside, um, in South Wellfleet here, for comparison, I pay $1,200 a year for 10,000 gallons. So it's very expensive here. Um, so it seems like a good thing for people to do. All right, well, thank you. Um, so um, I move to approve uh, the FY23 uh, Water Enterprise Fund as, um, as presented in a, and to insert it into the uh, 20, June 11, 2022 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. Second. Okay, um, roll call vote. John, I. Barbara, I. Michael, I. Ryan, I. Um, I'm going to um, say nay simply because I would have inserted it but not recommended it. We ha we haven't voted to recommend yet. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry. You um, Charlie, I think the are are these are the is that a separate article or is it included in an omnibus? It's it's article number seven. Okay, so I move to recommend um, the FY 2023 Water Enterprise Fund budget. Second. There's a second. Okay. Uh, Helen? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, can I roll call vote? John, aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Brian, aye. Helen, nay. Helen, did you vote to insert it? No, I voted against it. Okay. Now, wait a minute. So the previous motion was to approve it and insert it? Yep. Okay, well, I would have wanted to insert it, but I wouldn't have voted to approve it, so. 
let's just leave it at no. But I would have wanted the town to be able to vote on it. So I would have voted to insert it. Thank you. Doesn't matter. It's going in there. Don't worry about it. All right. Um, Charlie, um, to review the um, budget and financial updates. Oh. Um, and then we'll do the, the contingency budget as a separate, separate, yeah, separate. <laughs> that helps. So, uh, Charlie. Okay, thank you, um, Ryan. Okay, um, so this is sort of draft number seven, if you look at the financial forecast in your package, and the date says 4-27722, but it really should be 427-22. Um, so in, in a way, it's the sort of the last one before town meeting. Uh, but if you go to, um, you know, um, really uh, the, the end of page two in the forecast, that's sort of the uh, critical mass here. Not too much has changed in the um, formatting um, um, in, in the detail, um, but you really have to look at section three where it says projected surplus or deficit. And you can see that the um, projected deficit has increased to $1,191,520. And um, it's split up uh, between the operating deficit and um, capital and special project deficit. The operating uh, deficit is at $518,820. And the capital special projects is six seventy two seven hundred, dollars And that's increased by $150,000 largely. Um, that that six seventy two dollars is increased by $150,000 over um, some re recent versions of this. And that's because the board voted to increase the funding for the um, uh, OPEB trust fund from 50,000 to $150,000, which I think is a, a good decision. So, but that's a substantive change uh, that I wanna bring to your attention here. So um, anyway, um, that this uh, forecast really is focused on a budget um, that's article number one in the warrant book. And um, it essentially is a level services budget. You know, we've taken the programming departmental operations as they exist in fiscal year 2022, the current year. And we've um, um, replicated those for the most, with some few exceptions, but we've largely replicated that budget in the FY23 budget. So that's what you're getting for this investment. Um, and then on page three of the uh, forecast, which I, I don't think made it into your package. Um, I was looking at that the other, la this morning, when, well, I mean, uh, this afternoon when I get home and, but that is sort of the, 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 that page three shows that you've seen in the past is the impact uh, that on the on the tax rate uh, for these various um, overrides that we've been talking about, but anyway, that's what we're working on today. That deficit of the one million one hundred ninety one thousand five hundred twenty dollars. Okay, so well, one thing I would like to make clear to people, um, which is sometimes that deficit number is taken kind of out of context. Um, because Wellfleet doesn't have any funding dedicated to capital expenses. Um, so by default, essentially all of our capital items are um, in deficit um, to start with. And we, yeah. we find you know, different ways of funding them, but every year there are a number that have to go before town meeting for funding. Um, and it's not an instance where, you know, the the towns. It's yeah, it's not an instance where the the operating budget is essentially running, um, you know, a, a deficit of this extent. It's, you know, the operating budget running a deficit of you know the five hundred and eighteen thousand, um, and then the 
because we don't have any funding dedicated to capital items, I mean, yeah. So that's what the result is. So. Yeah, th thanks, Ryan. And I think, you know, even if you talk about the operating budget, I mean, you've been using a lot of one-time revenues, you know, to uh, beach revenues and um, ambulance receipts revenues and other sort of singular one-time revenues to subsidize the operating budget. That That's really created uh, that nature of that problem. And and Ryan's right, if you go back to June 26th, um, 2021, we had, um, or a couple of days later when we had the, the election, uh, we had, I think, 13 override questions on the ballot, you know, to, to repair um, facilities, to buy equipment. And in what you have been doing for the last couple of years is borrowing, some of them are like $8,000, $12,000, $20,000. And you've been borrowing those for five years. So um, it's really an unusual practice, I, maybe is the best way to describe it. And um, certainly not best management practices um, in Massachusetts. So this is gonna create a really a, a better situation where um, these monies by policy, you should dedicate um, towards future equipment replacement. Um, and so then you can create a capital plan that uses this money, you know, to buy the next cruiser or to buy the next truck or paint the next building. And then you, it's, it's not going to be enough to do all of the things that you need to do on an annual basis. But then, um, you know, you're going to, you know, with the practices we've started to set up and what you'll finalize um, and your policies and procedures, then you're going to have some free cash and um, that you can apply a portion of that towards capital and facility repairs as well. So I think it's gonna really put you in a, a good place going forward. And, you know, I think you've been, you know, it's kind of worked out borrowing uh, for stuff for the last couple of years because our interest rates have been so low. Uh, but I think we all know that, you know, that's gonna change. Um, we feel it already. Um, so with federal, you know, actions um, on, on these matters. So it, it, it's a good time to get out of that practice. And, um, and, I, and I, as I say, I just feel really confident that if we can, you know, talk to voters and educate them about, you know, why, how we got here and then, you know, where we want to go. And, and, and it just is going to create a foundation for operations going forward that I think um, is sustainable. The only thing that um, I really haven't done while I've been here to any great extent is looking at local receipts. I have with the water department, as you know, uh, but I do think that, that that's a whole nother area that we really need to take a look at. And, um, you know, property tax levy make up, you know, sort of two thirds of your revenue base but, um, but you really need to take a look at other opportunities for revenues. Um, so that's something that, you know, you can put in Rich Waldo's goals and objectives and um, <laughs> he, he's, already, he's already thinking about it. Um, so I, yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to expand on Ryan's comments. Okay. Um, Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of reiterate, I guess what Charlie just said, but also to, state that you know we generally we have not had uh um operation general operations override and uh, nobody's still yet been able to tell me the last time wellfleet had a general operating override mm -hmm. um i don't know when it was but our our costs as a municipality rise by more than two and a half percent per year just in um salaries wages benefits um union contracts and you know that's forced us to move more and more local receipts and to cover that without asking for uh, a general operating override. How, Charlie, how often does Brewster generally have an uh, operating budget override? Yeah, I really always planned them every six to eight years. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll tell you those, when I, when I used to go for those, they were in the range of six to $800,000. Um, now Brewster's, you know, frankly, twice as big, a little bit more budget-wise. But you know, and then at the same time, you know, we had 
sound policies to make sure that we had good free cash balances to help um, on the um, on the facilities and the equipment replacement side. Right. So uh, moving all of our local receipts and our one-time revenues to sort of stopgap that increase has just put us in a position where we're we're doing the the debt exclusions for our capital expenditures, and that actually causes property taxes to spike more in the short term because they're short-term borrowing articles. So I think it's important that everybody understands that we're actually restructuring the budget and putting it on a stable foundation for the future. I think when you look at um, what this will do in order to free us from this constant cycle of debt exclusions and uh, stabilize our operations so we're not dependent on having a record year for local receipts every year, um, it's gonna put us in a good position going forward. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's important that, you know, we have this dialogue with the community so they understand that this, is, this isn't just a capital budget deficit. It's the fact that, you know, we have to borrow for our capital items and, and that's what we're trying to move away from is doing the short-term borrowing on, on capital improvements and stuff like that. And, and two, I'm sorry, Ryan, just Mike reminded me. So, you know, even let's say, you know, you had this 672,000, if the community approves this, if they were, and you had this money and next year, you only um, needed to use $500,000 of that sum of money, then I would say to you, you should take the balance and put it in a capital stabilization fund, you know, start to build some reserves because the following year you might have $800,000 in facility repairs and equipment replacement. So that, that, that would be the next sort of logical step. Right, and the override is a continuous recurring revenue source. So um, people don't generally think about this, but you know, new construction is the only thing that gets us over two and a half percent without an override. Yeah. We had robust construction and development throughout the 80s, 90s, and early aughts, and we haven't had a major subdivision in, in eight years in the town of Wellfleet. So that sort of new development has sort of waned precisely at the time that costs have gone up and, and inflation just doesn't stop at town hall, town hall door, you know? So, um, yeah, that's it from me on this. John? Yeah, um, this seems to me it'd be a good subject uh, for the earlier item to uh, 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 set up as goals for our new town administrator to uh, come up with a list of uh, the, the items we know are recurring. You know, we need a new police cru cruiser every X number of years. Let's plan for it. We need uh, uh, a new uh, front end loader every 15 years or whatever it might be. We need to plan for it. But there's also the possibility that we may have infrastructure casualties as a result of uh, uh, climate or weather yeah. um, that could 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 slap us with something unexpected, and we need to plan for that too. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to ask is, uh, Charlie, for you to Charlie, is if uh, we could have that um, tax impact. Uh, that we, if we could put that up on the screen since we didn't get it in our packets. Okay. Um, Jude? Yes, thank you, Chair. To reiterate that you're talking about educating the public and we don't have that in front of us. So we definitely need to get that out there either in the packet or somewhere that we can see. Um, and also, D says budget and financial update. The financial update I took to mean the Department of Revenue, the variance, you know, where are we with that? And will the public see some sort of summary as to what was discovered about the not missing money or what could we expect? Sure. Um, so Charlie, um, I, I've, I've had this discussion with you a few times. Um, uh, can you just update? the public on where the uh, DOR um, DLS report when we could possibly expect it? Yeah, well, um, so a couple of things. Um, I was gonna do it during my, my report, but um, 
So relative to the fiscal auditing process that we've been going through for FY20 and FY21, um, you know, we're clearly behind for reasons that I've articulated in the past. Um, but I did talk to Lisa Sauve and Mary McIsaac um, yesterday and today. We have a meeting planned on Thursday. And our, our goal really uh, within the next couple of days um, is we'll finish um, the review for fiscal year 2020. We'll close the books for fiscal 20. And um, we'll have a report uh, where we'll talk about, you know, what we've found um, and what the nature of that variance um, issue was. So we're, we're closing in on that. And um, I think maybe we could have a special meeting on that all by itself. Now, once we close FY20, um, FY21 will follow rapidly within a week to 10 days um, because, um, 20 was really the, the significant problematic year. Lisa Sauve was here for good portions of 21. Uh, so we're more confident in the documentation. Uh, but um, as I say, I, we're really so close. We're anxious to have it done. I know people are anxious for us to have it done. Um, and, I, and I will say fiscal year 20 had, had so many challenges so many errors, um, so many omissions, um, so many corrections. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, it, it had value um, to spend this time on it because what we've uncovered is just a level of um, errors and omissions, you know, by local officials doing the everyday accounting and treasury functions that are basic and inherent in a municipal operation. But, you know, it's like a ball of yarn that's tangled up and we've been pulling strings and it leads us into unusual places, um, but um, we're really satisfied with where we're at. And I think we're gonna, as I say, in the next few days, we're gonna have that finished up. So, um, so once, you know, once 20 and 21 are closed, We'll be presenting that to the Department of Revenue um, and they'll be reviewing that. And I'm not quite sure when they'll have their final report done. They're just way, way behind. There's so many um, demands. Um, Wellfleet isn't the only community that's suffering uh, from a lack of you know, um, financial uh, people doing these functions is a huge shortage. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll be working with them to close out the fiscal year. And, um, and, and we've already sort of had conversations with the auditors and um, in the next few weeks, they'll, they'll be starting their efforts as well. So, you know, as I say, it's coming to a conclusion that we're really happy with. And um, we think that um, it'll, it'll be the basis of, you know, reasonable, solid municipal operations going forward. And our new staff is on board and they're slowly acclimating and taking on more responsibilities um, from Lisa and Mary. So it, it bodes well going forward. Okay. And the DLS report? Yeah, the DLS report, I just don't know a date on that, Ryan. They were down a couple of weeks ago and they've just indicated that they're just overwhelmed with all the demands that they have. I don't have a date for that study that they're, they're working on. Okay. Um, Jude? So it's sounding like it won't be before town meeting. I, uh, this closing fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 will be done before town meeting, yes. So you'll be able to, answered questions from the public about that so that before we're asked for signing on to this budget and an override, we know what happened and what's gonna change going forward and where the problems were. You know, we've waited a long time and I, I just, you said a couple of weeks ago, it'd be a couple of weeks and now we're here. So 
I just, yeah. I'm worried that we're not going to have this information before town meeting. Yeah, well, you know, it, you know, my position is we will. I, I think that, you know, town meeting really deals with the business that's on the warrant. I, you know, have talked to the moderator about some leeway, um, you know. Well, we uh, don't I, need if to I, approve if, of if, a budget. If, Excuse if me. If, if I, I'd like to finish without being interrupted, if I could. Okay, sorry. That's quite all right. Uh, maybe you didn't know I wasn't quite done yet. Um, but anyway, I have talked to the moderator a little bit about, you know, some leeway on town meeting floor, but I think it would be more advantageous to try to do something publicly before town meeting. I agree, because we have a lot of questions still. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, are there any other uh, questions about uh, the budget um, at this point? John? I'd still like to see that tag, the, that sheet we didn't get if we can put it up. Is it possible to put it up or not? I don't know if Rebecca has that handy to bring up now. Yeah, I don't have it, so. All right. Yeah. All right, um, the uh, contingency budget. Charlie, um, and um, yeah, can I share the screen, Rebecca? I think it will make it a little easier. Yeah, of course. Hang on one second. Is that what we got in that email? Yes. And then I I will look for that third sheet, John, while he's sharing his screen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You should be able to see it. Is it showing a spreadsheet? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the issues um, that we've had to deal with is um, is if the um, override were to fail, if the voters don't support the override, now this is the general operating budget override, um, we need to have a contingency budget um, available uh, that we present and voters uh, adopt. Um, so what that means is um, that we really need to cut, you know, approximately, you know, um, five hundred and twenty thousand dollars out of the uh, town operating budget. So um, the way that this would be presented is Article Number One would be uh, the operating budget that we've been talking about all winter long. Article Number Two will be an operating budget for fiscal 2023 with reductions in expenditures. And if you take a look at uh, the last, uh, the bottom of this spreadsheet, when we get there, um, this, these cuts would reduce uh, expenditures by $523,339. Um, now, um, maybe if we can go back to the top of this spreadsheet, uh, thank you. So uh, what ha you know what happened? It, it, and I I would just like to say that um, uh, I'd like to thank all of our department heads. Um, you know, and, and that that thanks goes well beyond um, just working on this particular project. And um, when I really you know think about what Wellfleet has gone through. Um, and you know, you've had some horrendous fiscal problems um, um, that you know really are a result of a lot of turnover, competency issues, lack of training um, uh, amongst your financial staff. Um, and uh, but but department heads have kept Wellfleet running and operating under really difficult circumstances. So you know you have department heads that um, that work well together, that play well together, that do their very best to provide uh, you know reasonable, responsive services to the community. So they're they're sort of victims of um, uh, this whole uh, process, um, uh, but they've been um, they deserve a lot of credit, and I just wanted to recognize them. So what we what we've done now is I met with every single department head yesterday, um, and we uh, went over their operating budgets and we kind of looked at um, the spending plan that we had originally created, 
And, um, and if you look at the spreadsheet, we've made a series of um, reductions and you can see that in the column um, on, the, on the right there in the red. Uh, so if you will start with accounting um, and we've reduced uh, the data processing budget by $25,000. Um, and that, that budget I think currently has a, um, um, expenses in the range of um, about um, $38,000. So, you know, we, you know, there is a little bit of a risk there, um, but we do have some old articles with some well, data processing you know, money. I mean, I'm trying, but. Yeah. Rebecca, can you mute yourself? Oh, um, we do have some, um, old articles with some data processing money that would make that at least sustainable for one year. And then I'll, I'll just quickly go down um, the assessor's budget. Uh, we've reduced contracted services by $10,000 um, and training by $1,000. The contracted services is some work that Paul Capinos does for us on the commercial um, valuations. We contacted Paul, Nancy Vale did, and we think that um, these are secular um, services that we um, uh, um, <clears throat> work that we have to do, um, but we, he did feel that we could put it off one year. So that's that. The treasurer collector, we met with Cameron Scott, our new treasurer collector, and um, you can see he made a number of modest uh, changes to his budget that he thought looking at expenditures for the current fiscal year would be uh, okay to do. And then we also uh, found that we had this line item that's called debt, administra debt administration fee that we have $35,000 in. And we really haven't been spending that um, money for the last few years. We checked with our financial advisor and we thought that, um, that we could reduce that down to $5,000, decreasing it by $30,000 with very little impact on services. If we have a big bond issuance, we'll have to build those costs into the bond issuance itself. So that's that's sort of low hanging fruit and I think easy to do. Um, the town clerk, I'm just gonna keep running through these, Ryan, is that all right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, then and then I'll get to the members of the board. Yeah, um, the town clerk um, uh, reviewed um, so, sort of her, uh, Thank you. The town clerk reviewed her budget. And because we're having a state election next fall, some of the training um, and travel that she would normally participate in and we would want her to, she won't be able to do it this year. So she's made a series of small reductions there and we reduced her part-time staff by several hours. Um, Shellfish, now we're getting to more substantive issues. And, and Ryan, at some point, I'd like some of the department heads to be able to talk about this, but on the shellfish budget, we, we've reduced the uh, part-time um, and seasonal wages by $10,400. And this is gonna have an impact that people are gonna feel because we're gonna have to um, only allow recreational shell fishing, I think one uh, day per year where it, one day per week versus two. Um, so Nancy can talk about that in more detail. Same thing, um, we've reduced the aqua aquaculture supplies by $6,000. She's gonna have to use a revolving fund to help deal with that issue. Um, the housing authority, uh, the, the housing trust had asked for $3,000 as a budget allowance uh, to deal with issues, we, in, we built that into the budget for FY23, but in, in light of the fact that I had to cut so much money, that, that new funding request I had to eliminate. Um, within the town administrator's budget, we had built in $50,000 for consulting. Um, and um, um, typically that budget is $20,000. Uh, we built in 30,000. Oh. Sorry, Charlie. Um, we're at uh, 196 consultant. 196. Sorry. Yeah. I'll clarify that going forward. Thanks. So budget 196, I've reduced it from 50,000 to 40,000. And um, so we still have the money that we're going to need for Lisa and Mary to provide support. But the 
the town administrators consulting allocation is going to be reduced by that ten thousand um, dollars. The police department uh, has made really a substantive uh, budget two ten police uh, reducing their expenses accounts by almost twenty seven thousand dollars, and then under two fifteen communications by almost twenty thousand dollars. I think Chief should talk about this. These are some import. These are some critical. Um, items that we have to reduce um, relative, particularly with some of the mental health um, support services that we are trying to build into the budget that compromised here. Um, but, you know, we, we had to come up with some ways to save money. So um, anyway, those two items, the budget number 220, the fire department, um, Chief Polly has uh, suggested a reduction of $48,000. And this is in a vast array of training and expense categories within the fire department. And there's certainly risk and concern with these cuts, but uh, we, everybody had to participate. Um, budget number 241, we've reduced the part-time and temporary uh, labor account and the seminar and training account, neither, neither ones that I, I wanted to do, uh, but um, we, we had to find money where we could. Um, budget number two, 417, 420, 422, 433, it's all essentially DPW um, um, cuts. And, and they're substantive. Um, we're cutting a lot of contracted services. Um, Jay can talk about it in more detail. We're cutting seasonal weight uh, seasonal workforce in half. Um, and so what's going to happen is the DPW um, in this situation is going to, the full-time people are going to have to pick up more responsibility um, to do a lot of these uh, tasks that come out through the year. And so we're going to be less responsive and less resilient with these cuts. Uh, but Department of Public Works is such a big part of the, the budget. I, we, we had to hit, hit it hard. Um, and then under transfer station number 433, I'm recommending that we cut amnesty day. That's $13,000. Um, so I, I don't need to talk to you about amnesty day. You all know what that is. Um, now, budget number 520 is human services budget. And um, we're cutting that under this proposal from 305 to 205. Uh, Suzanne Thomas is, is on the call, I'm quite sure. And um, we did take a look at spending in this category under the tuition preschool voucher program. And, and frankly, $50,000 of this reduction doesn't have a significant impact because we don't have people using all of these fundings. But it does, you know, eliminate the opportunities for people going forward. And then $50,000 is a cut and will impact people who are re receiving uh, benefits out under the voucher program. So this is a real cut and has real um, impacts on uh, members of our community. Um, library, uh, budget number 610. Uh, I know Jennifer is on the line and I mean, these are just heartbreaking costs. Um, we would have to close the library on Monday. You know, right now we're open seven days a week, um, but you know, the library is a relatively large part of our municipal operations, and we just had to hit everybody um, in order to come up with this sum of money. So and Jennifer can talk about it further, but um, you know, this is concerning, and we don't we don't recommend it. We don't like it at all. Recreation uh, budget, seasonal um, work, you know, workers cutting $19,000. Um, this is going to reduce the opportunities for people to participate in our, in our, in our recreation program. So it's, 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 it's significant and impactful. And then um, if you take a look at budget number 660, community services and 699 beaches, um, these are, you know, we're going to be having to cut services during the end of the year. 
um, on our beaches. Um, and um, once again, we just, we don't feel good about these cuts at all, uh, but we had really limited opportunities. And then budget number 913, I'm suggesting reducing unemployment from 30,000 to 20. And, you know, I, you know, we took a look at un unemployment costs and um, what we've been spending. And I think this is uh, possible without great impact. And if we end up with, you know, um, more unemployment costs, we can deal with it at the fall, uh, fall town meeting. But I think that's not terribly problematic. And then um, I'm showing this as budget number 914, group health insurance, reducing that by $25,000. And what I'm really um, doing there is the marina, the town, it says marine, but the town marina will have to cut some of their seasonal workforce and pay for some of their healthcare costs uh, for their workforce over at the marina. So the total of all of these sub accounts is that $523,339,000. And it gets us, you know, within that target number that we would have to cut if the, um, if the override were to fail. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's obvious that services that people utilize um, extensively would be impacted. Um, it also leaves town and government or governance um, more fragile than, um, than, you know, what we're hoping to achieve with the override. Um, but um, I, I guess I'll just go to the board members and then um, ask the department heads um, to speak on each one of their, their budgets, if that makes sense, Charlie. Uh, I would really encourage that, yes. Okay, um, Barbara. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I really appreciate all the work you did, uh, Mr. Sumner, with your department heads um, on, on finding these areas to cut, I guess, I, is, is it appropriate, Mr. Chairman, to comment on on the items listed? I, this is my first time around, so. Um, yes, but um, you know, for the departments, I would like to try to have the department head yes. speak first before we make comments on their individual mm -hmm. line items. Um, okay, I, I guess if, if I could just make a brief comment, it just seems that the human services and the voucher program just seems, you know, that is a tough hit. And as a, as a percentage of um, you know the reduction in the budget, you know that is really substantial compared to the other um, the other departments, which each of which you know m managed to find places to cut back. But it's just really noticeable that um, the reduction in that budget is is really substantial, and it's a program that I'm sure is really valuable. Um, to young families in town. So um, I hope that was not an inappropriate comment at this time. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Helen? Yeah, um, I trust this was considered, but a number of the cuts have to do with um, training and, you know, uh, different, you know, there are different, different kinds of um, educational um, things. And are any of those through you to Charlie? Uh, Ryan, um, yep. are any of those requirements, because very often uh, certain positions require that you become, you know, recertified. And I trust that none of them are in that category, because it would mean that the, whatever that staff person was, that they wouldn't really be fully legally qualified if they hadn't re-upped. So are any of those training uh, cuts having to do with that kind of training requirement. Uh, the um, I, 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 I I'm a little concerned about answering that relative to fire and police. So I'd ask them to speak to that relative to the other areas. Uh, there were some other cuts that were suggested um, that impacted training um, that I rejected. The ones that I did show as cuts was really a situation because that particular department had couldn't take advantage um, of the programming uh, in that in the upcoming fiscal year. 
um, for, for good reasons. Um, or uh, there were situations where there are employees that have been here a long time and have a lot of experience and deferring at one year was thought of as manageable. Okay. Not, 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 I, and I, I, I will say, I think Barbara's point was so, I mean, one of the reasons I retired as a town administrator back in 2015 is I, 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 I hate so much going through this process because, um, you know, it really does, it cuts right to the core of what we do for local government. And um, so, I mean, it was just an awful ordeal to go through. Um, I, I tried to avoid eliminating full-time positions um, that happened with this plan um, for, for obvious reasons. But, you know, and really, you know, your municipal budget and your scope of municipal service is not that broad and you have a lot of people doing a lot of things. So uh, you have really small departments with one and two person departments. So there's not a lot of opportunities to, to cut costs. Ryan, I'm sorry, I yeah. didn't feel that my question was clearly answered. And so, so with the um, ones regarding the, the, the fire and police, I think it would be better to include that during um, a discussion with the department heads of, of that. Um, I, I think for the the other ones, Charlie's answer was was pretty much no um, for the administrative. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So all the people that would not be taking those trainings would still be legally qualified to have their positions uh, in you know, the opinion of the state. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mike. Yeah, I just want to point out that these these are not really one year cuts. Um, the operating budget, these were cut one year. In order to restore them, we're going to wind up in the same position and in a worse position. So Charlie, it, could, could you kind of explain what the impact would be of going down this road as far as our next year, uh, what kind of uh, position we would be in compared to where we are if we um, go with option A here and set ourselves onto a stable path. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're really undermining, you know, the, the, any resiliency within these departments and budgets. And um, it's really, you're, you're cutting out core important services that people rely on. And, you know, I, you know I've gone through these awful processes in the past and it takes years to reestablish these costs for the reasons that Mike DeVasto talked about earlier um, because health insurance costs go up and pension costs go up it, it's hard to reestablish these kind of cuts it, it take it can take several years to recover from something like this but you know if you you know really if if you think about um, it's it, the impact uh, on all of these departments and operations. Um, they really affect the services that they can provide to people in their response time and their resiliency. So it, it's, it, this is really um, uncomfortable for me to even talk about. Okay. All right. And, um, and just, just to follow up, like, so if, 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 if we, don't pass an override this year, which will bring us up to the level of operating that is our, our sort of, our departments have been level funding their operations in general over several years, other than the cost increases of, of, of the salaries, wages and pensions, new staff, whatever we've needed to, to deal with, but the actual expenses of these departments, plus, you know, things like preschool vouchers, those sort of things like they're, integral to you know what we've built as a community and i just think it's it's so important to take this opportunity to really put our operating budget in on a stable foundation where you know um we can start applying these uh local receipts to 
to capital items and things like that and, and really stabilizing uh, town government of the future and working on issues like staff retention and training and and really you know planting the seeds for for you know a better wealth fleet yeah yeah uh, so essentially if if these cuts are made this year that there is an ongoing cut or, or a reduction in service the only way to restore service later would be contingent on future overrides to reestablish certain services. Right. Um, so, um, but, so I, um, in terms of, before we get to the shellfish, which is the, the first one, um, so is there anything else that you'd like to address um, under the administra administration's dis discretion, Charlie? Not at the moment. Okay. Uh, I'll excuse myself from the shellfish uh, discussion. Okay. On that um, particular line item. Um, my my one question is is if, if we have a debt administrative fee uh, or budget built into the current budget, um, would it make sense to to reduce that amount in in the budget that we're proposing to, to uh, on town or to the town? Probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a that that's one area that you know, now that we have Cameron here really looking at the detail, I think that should happen anyway. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I would like to see that. Um, all right, uh, Nancy. Hang on one sec. Okay, um, so we would basically go back to having a part-time seasonal uh, deputy. So we would have two part-time seasonal deputies as opposed to the full-time that, that we have that runs from mid-May to the end of October. Um, so it's, it's losing, I think it's 17 hours overall. And those hours are spent uh, at the rec area on propagation activities and admin support to me. So unfortunately, like we have so many permits and we sell so many recreational shellfishing permits and in the summer, you can only go two days a week. So it's just very crowded. You can't do it without having two people anymore. You just you just can't do it. It's it's not responsible. And so from June until June first till September thirtieth, we would need two deputies. And but we also it's our most uh, productive time for being on our grant. And we have live product. You know we have oysters and clams that need to be tended. So. The way this works out is that each of the two part-time deputies would work uh, two days on the grant with Johnny and uh, one day on the rec area. So the rec area would no longer be open on Wednesdays. It would only be open on Sundays. And yes, that's going to concentrate people there, but we have two people to handle it. We can't do it without two people. So that's... Uh, the first thing, and then in addition, because things take, uh, things with grants take so much documentation and backup and public hearing notices, and there's just a lot of administrative things that happen. So what we would do is say that between May and October, we would do no regulation changes and we would do no grant public hearings. We will focus on those in the winter time when we have more time available. I have more time available, but um, between May and October, that's Vibrio season. That's our top priority. We have grant inspections to do for over a hundred farms. Um, you know, we have propagation activities and those will always take precedence. So I, I've talked to other towns and, and other towns have uh, with less staff, uh, this is how they approach it. In fact, uh, I spoke with uh, Nicole Payne in East Ham, and, and they too don't do anything in the summertime uh, with a select board because that's our time for being in the field more than anything. 
So this will have an effect on the services that the shellfish department uh, provides, but I, our budget, our um, expense budget is, you know, only $28,000. We, you know, it's just nothing. I could never find enough to make a 5% cut there. So unfortunately it has to come out of staff. Okay, and the aquaculture supplies? <clears throat> that um, we can take from the revolving fund. Okay, are there questions from the board? Um, Charlie, do you have anything to add? No, no, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, these are painful. So uh, I think we're all under the awareness of that. Uh, but we really do need to, uh, I would say, redouble our efforts in making the um, the voters of the town aware of, of what's at stake here. Um, so thank you. Um, so let's see, consultancy that's, so Mary and Lisa are, are being retained, Charlie? Under this uh, proposal? I, yes, I still have uh, monies available for their uh, support services. Okay, um, and I'm assuming this means that there is less money available for other consulting needs as they occur. Yeah, you know, for example, um, you know, when I got here, um, we had to update the hazardous mitigation plan. We hadn't provided any funding for that. I think it was $14,000 um, off the top of my head. Um, and it was critical to get that done to be eligible for grants going forward. So I used that $20,000 that I had in the town administrator's budget to advance that project. So that's an example of where we would use it. Yep. Okay. Um, so police, Chief Hurley. And um, will you spe be speaking to the co communications or um, both, both Chief Hurley and Chief Polly? Uh, Mr. I'll be talking to uh, line 210 police and 215 communication is under the police department's uh, purview. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the board. I, you know, first, I just want to start that. Um, you know, Charlie and the finance teams. You know, really professionalism and care through this process. You know, doesn't go unnoticed, especially for somebody like myself who's been in town for quite a long time. Um, these are tough cuts. It's it's tough for all of us, and um, I think as a team, we're going to work through this and, and see how we can still maneuver around it, but I just wanted to start with that. Um, you know, we had healthy discussions on both my budgets, police and communications, with salary and wage versus expense. Uh, to be bluntly honest, on the police side, when it came to salary and wage, to cut overtime, to cut special events, for me to say, we're going to pull off the beaches, we're not going to cover Oyster Fest, we're not going to I mean, those aren't legitimate options. We're going to get called to these events. We're going to have to respond to these events. And unless the select board in the town wants to start canceling these events or not allowing them, then we need to keep those uh, monies intact to respond to the events when they come to town. On the communication side, you know, I have to keep that uh, organization running 24 seven. I mean, there's no closing it for eight hours a day. There's no transferring the phone line somewhere. So that was also very limited um, under salary and wage. So really we then turned over to the expense side and, you know, under police that is going to affect training to answer Helen's question. We will get all state mandated training completed. That That is priority number one, you know, A, for the legality of staying certified and for the town's protection. But there's going to be a lot of other things that we train at. And I'm a big proponent of training, you know, training limits litigation. Um, and it's, you know, your sergeants, they're your first line supervisors out in the field that are protecting the town making decisions. And the more they're trained and educated, um, you know, the better we all are. You know, there's a one week community uh, crisis intervention training that all my staff tries to attend in order to really deal with these mental health issues in our community. Along with uh, this fiscal year, we just launched a mental health check-in program for all 
sworn and civilian staff, including myself, and I'll be going to my appointment in a few weeks. And I just, I just think it's critical and we need to take care of our staff. We need to keep an eye on everybody, especially during these tough times. So that'll be the effects on the police side, along with some equipment that won't get replaced. Um, and we'll take it from there. On the communication side, again, training will be impacted along with maybe our ability not to pay some contract services to vendors, which is the best way to explain it. It's kind of an insurance policy in the event that some of this equipment, which has become much more technical and much more expensive. Uh, we went from a two camera system in our road facility to 39 cameras in our new facility. So um, there's a lot that we need to cover, but it had to get cut at the moment. So those are the highlighted cuts uh, within the police and communication. Um, Chief, could you speak to um, the increase in the, um, the mental health aspect um, that you that the department sees in responding to many of its calls? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's, it's just really interwoven into our everyday um, calls for service and you know, what we're really seeing on, on top of that happening is that what comes along with that is the complexity and the time consumption on these calls. I mean, sometimes the officers are spending hours on these calls to try to resolve an issue, a family issue, um, trying to get support systems in. And, you know, living on the out of Cape is beautiful at times, but let me tell you, when you need to get services in, when you need to get a psychologist in in the middle of the night, when you need to move somebody off Cape to a facility, um, it's it's time consuming. Um, and it's really, it is affecting day-to-day -day operations um, and really losing that summer program where those were some assignments you could pass on to those officers to keep our trained full-timers available and ready for, you know, 911 emergency response calls is really critical. Um, it's uh, it's going to have an impact. Uh, you know, mental health is is not going away. Okay. Are there any questions uh, from the board for the chief? Okay. Um, chief Polly. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I'm going to have to. Um, also preface this when I'm, I'm feeling lousy. <laughs> it came on yesterday, so I really don't have the ability to speak very much other than um, to answer Helen's question. Yes, we will continue to train to meet the state minimum requirements for EMS and fire, uh, both uh, with the national level and at the state level. Uh, but there's, there's gonna have to be cuts in the EMS equipment and supplies, maybe even turnout gear, tools and equipment, uh, as you may recall, we've had to put up folks for very expensive lodging over the last year because we could not house them in area fire stations uh, up at the Bridgewater Fire Academy or the Fire Academy in Stowe. We may have the ability to, to relook at that. Uh, I certainly would like to because it saves an awful lot of money in it. It's just a good experience when you know our firefighters are going up for their certification training for 10 weeks to be able to stay in another fire station and learn some things and and see some staff and see how things are done a little differently. So that's gonna be my first priority to see if we can revisit that and, and um, not have to at least have as much money going out the door for that, if you if you will. The, the only thing I can say is um, I, I've been, I went through a very, very similar um, uh, exercise and experience in 2007, 2008, when I was fire chief in West Boylston uh, and our budgets are going to need some flexibility in where we make these cuts as we move on through the fiscal year uh, coming up in July if we have to. Uh, so I would ask, ask uh, certainly in, in working with the town administrator and in the financial team, we're going to need some flexibility here at some point because the cuts have to be managed. And, you know, I may be in a position where I can take some money out of salaries and save some money so I can buy fire protective turnout gear or EMS equipment. So I would just ask that the board keep that in mind, you know, we'll certainly do our very best, but we're gonna need a little flexibility in terms of 
where we take a dollar here, a hundred dollars there, a thousand dollars there. Okay. Well, thank you, Chief. Um, are there any questions from the board? Okay. Um, uh, Jay Norton. Hi, Jay. Hey, Mr. Chair, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. So I'll just start this off by saying, you know, obviously this is a difficult task to go through each line item in the DPW budget, especially considering um, the, the demands in the department are, are already stretched thin as it is. Um, so having these cuts is definitely gonna have an impact on our existing staff and our response times and, and potentially our retainment of staff. Um, but I, I'll start off with, uh, so DPW facilities. So the contracted services line item will be reduced by $19,000. And that was basically an increase from FY22 of about 20%. And that was based on just projected inflation for contract services, which really include um, plumbing services, electrical, um, fire inspection, alarm monitoring, generator servicing, HVAC services, all of that type of um, services that could potentially, we could run out of money at the end of the year and it would affect you know, town facilities in, in that respect. Um, the reduction in seasonal employees uh, will have a major impact mainly on, on summer services. So transfer station, we would probably have to go back to just open five days a week, whereas we are normally open seven days a week in the summer. Um, it will also impact our ability to pick up trash in town, which is obviously um, very extensive in the summertime. Um, and then just our response times on um, managing the cemeteries um, and just uh, the, you, you know, um, lawns and town and, and buildings. So that, that will have a major impact on summer services. Um, Amnesty Day, you know, obviously that's a community, the, the community loves that day. It's, uh, it's been in, instituted for years. So that could be an issue on the public side, but it's not really a major impact to our department services that we provide. Um, and then the education, training, travel, meals and lodging, um, obviously will have an impact. It's not gonna have an impact on any type of licensure that our employees need to keep or any continuing education classes on that aspect. And, um, we can be creative and, and trying to find some some ways to uh, find some you know free programs out there. But it, I'm a huge advocate for for education and training and continuing education. So um, that is definitely an impact that we'll we'll have. Okay, and um, the highway budgets, um, contract services. Yeah, so that, that's basically just road maintenance and crack sealing, pavement, um, preventative maintenance on our roads. So that will have an impact, line striping, all of that stuff, which um, obviously has a safety impact. Um, if, you know, if we can't stripe a road or we can't stripe a, a crosswalk, that obviously has some public safety impacts uh, with, associated with that. Okay, so... In terms of both the highway and the DPW facilities, I mean, I mean, this just means that we're deferring more maintenance um, and, and the condition of the facilities and the, the roads would deteriorate faster than they otherwise would. That's correct. Um, and then um, for the seasonal, how many positions would it be? So we currently, we have six open positions. So we'd go down to three with that budget cut. Okay, and the DPW is also used to support um, a number of other de um, town departments. Would they be looking at a reduction in the level of support that they could expect to receive out of the DPW? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, probably uh, the beaches would be most impacted by that. Okay, Mike. Um, yeah, so we see what this looks like this year. Uh, what's it look like next year if you had to continue to retain these types of cuts? I mean, what what um, what impact would it have? Like, I'm I'm assuming that would be quite devastating to carry these through continuously year over year. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with fuel costs rising and the, the cost of asphalt increasing and um, just general um, inflation on all of these services that were, you know, with our contracted services and um, HVAC systems and all of that, it's, it's just going to be increasing costs. And if we just keep level funding our budget, it's, it's going to reduce the amount of money we can spend on, on keeping our facilities up to date and, um, you know, keeping on our preventative maintenance program. Yeah, I just like to make a comment on the amount of deferred maintenance that we've seen in this town and what it's cost us over the year deferring maintenance, we already operate on a pretty shoestring budget as far as it goes as a town. So, you know, when you don't have maintenance, regular maintenance on, on structures and buildings, you know, you, they wind up in disrepair to the point where they need to be replaced, then maybe they could have had another 30 years of life had they been maintained. So, you know, I'm just making the point that these aren't just one year reductions that we can sort of, you know, pass off this year and not, and, and, and not wind up in the same position next year or a worse position really um, by going down this road. So I, I, that, that's the only point I'm making right now about that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not sustainable. Okay, John? Yeah, uh, on the maintenance issue, that's, that's been a uh, uh, bone of contention for me for some time. Uh, and something that the town has needed to address for some time before this budget, this possible budget constraint came along. Um, however, I, I, I'm curious as to, I, I'm assuming that if we have to go with plan B here, it's going to at least temporary, temporarily derail what we were talking about earlier, which is setting up a, uh, a rational ongoing capital budget for timely replacement. <laughs> equipment and vehicles, is that correct? It would vary. Um, I mean, it would in increase the um, the capital requests um, if, if things are not being maintained properly yeah. over time. Um, you know, it, I mean, it, it's a difference between like ongoing maintenance and, and you know, capital because you, you know, things haven't been maintained. I guess it was, I, I guess it was two different things I was addressing here. The, the, uh, the maintenance is one issue, which I think has been an issue before the possibility of a budget of budget cuts came up. Uh, the capital replacement program um, outside of maintenance, just, you know, things that age out and have to be replaced. Uh, we were talking about the desirability of coming up with a, a, an ongoing plan to not have to have overrides every time we need to replace a police car or, or a fire truck. Uh, but that, that program would have to be put on hold too, I would think, if, if we are cutting budgets. Um, so that's kind of separate. It's a different override, um, but if the operation override fails, more than likely um, that that override would also fail. Um, there is a, a capital improvement plan right now. It goes out to five years. Um, a lot of times things are, are cut from that and, and put off to the following years. Um, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, separate, but included, I guess. Um, Charlie? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the, they're all related, I guess. Um, 
you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, what I've learned since I've been here is your DPW under their facilities program does a lot. I mean, they, they do more than most other towns relative to uh, facility repairs and maintenance and upgrades. So that's all gonna be compromised, which means it's gonna be shoved into the capital budget and then it's gonna impact, you know, replacement and, you know, the Ryan talked, you know, we did put together a five-year capital plan. It, it needs a lot of work, uh, but the, the elements are there. It's gonna impact that. It's just, there's a, they're interrelated. And I'm right, Ryan, when we get done, I do have that third page that I can bring up when we're done with this conversation that shows the tax rate impacts, so. Okay. Are there any other questions for Jay? Okay. Um, okay, uh, Suzanne uh, Thomas, uh, Human Services. Is she on? I'm here, there I am. There Just are. unmuted. Good Sorry. evening. I was fighting with my iPad. Yes, human services. This is a very painful cut to make because it will impact minimum of 20 families every year if the uh, voucher amount is reduced from its current level of 7,000. If it's re if the overall funding is reduced by 100,000, our cap would now be determined by how many children qualify in any one year. And that number of children would be divided into $100,000 instead of $200,000. So for instance, this year we have 20. Each one of them would have received 5,000 instead of 7,000. Now the parents budget on the seven. And when you've got a household with two young parents, both working to support themselves, a deficit of $2,000 in anticipated funding is a significant hit. And I really hate to do it, but the other alternative is to reduce it altogether, which I would not recommend. So reducing it by the hundred um, seems less painful because families will, would still get something even if they won't get everything that they are anticipating. Okay. Uh, Barbara, I, I believe you had questions for her. Um, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it was really more of just a comment, just that this line item just really took a disproportionate hit as compared to other departments. And, and that was my only, that was my only point. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mike. Yeah, I'm just going to make a comment and it's, it's really a question of, you know, why, why are we here? Why are we talking about these budget cuts right now? Um, and it's, it's nothing to do with the accounting issues. It's to do with the fact that we've done our best as a town to keep our property tax rates as low as possible. And we're talking about cutting facility management, vital equipment, training, social services, town services, people's jobs, preschool vouchers, amnesty day, and what's lost in here is that we're a wealthy community. Residents may not be wealthy, but as a community, as a whole, the people who make up our property tax base, it is a wealthy town. And we have gone year over year of avoiding having any overrides and band-aiding our operating budget in order to keep our property tax low and essentially subsidizing with these cuts the taxes that second homeowners, short-term rental property owners, um, and you know, people of great wealth are paying to have property in the town of Wellfleet. And so this is not a choice at all, if you ask me. I, I, I don't like this exercise. I don't like that we went, that we had to do this. Um, and, and this is largely a result of having to have, due to circumstances, pushed our town meeting into into June and not had time to respond if, if the override failed. Um, so, um, but I just, just wanna make the point that, you know, we, we've, we've as a community ext extended our, our, our 
um, residential property tax exemption up to 25% in order to offset and curb the impact of property uh, tax increase. Essentially what that means is that the increase in, in, in property tax from this operating budget override should be fairly light on, on residents. And we have 25% of our, our property owners are residents, 75% are, are second homeowners or, or, or um, investment property owners or whatever it may be. And that that's amount that residents save is, is sort of um, shared by a broad section, three quarters of the town of the second homeowners that offset that. So their increase in property taxes is because of those exemptions is, is smaller. Um, so I, I just think we need to look at, you know, sort of why we're here and what we're looking at. And, and the fact that we have this really robust um, community and we've, we really are a, a resort town that millions of people want to come to. And I don't think we should be selling ourselves short here um, as far as the town services that we can provide and, and what we can afford as a, as a community. Um, we, we really have been, you know, uh, running a tight ship as far as like, look at our public bathrooms, look at our computers at the library, the expenditures that we've, we've deferred over years and years and years and years and not having any overrides, operations overrides has led to this point where, you know, it's a $500,000 override. If eight years ago we had an override, it wouldn't be $500,000 right now, you know? Um, so we just, I think we need to focus on the big picture. And I just want to make that point that what we're looking at cutting, it, it seems unnecessary to me. Okay. So, I mean, one of the things that we need to make clear is, is to the town and townspeople is what's at stake. Um, and, you know, this is definitely something that is at stake throughout the budget. Um, the, the increase in residential exemption, um, I, I did that memo, I don't know what, two months ago, um, that can go up. So basically if the operating override is under 800,000, there is not an effective increase in the, the tax, um, or the tax rate for uh, a resident of the town of Wellfleet um, on property taxes. Um, but uh, John? Yeah, I don't think we need to convince each other uh, that of the undesirability of making these cuts. I, I, I don't think there's any question in the minds of any of us on the board that these are things none of us want to do. Um, but we have to remember that there is a perception out there and it's a perception that's based on on a reality the reality brought forth by these audits and and uh, the failure to address the issues in those audits that has brought us to where we are and we we have a big job ahead of us to rebuild public trust that we can handle the public's money that's what the issue is here and that's what the job is that we have to do, not to convince each other, but to convince the voters in town that, uh, that we are worthy of that trust. And I think it might not be a bad idea to consider uh, coming up with a, uh, a press release detailing the contrast between these two budgets and exactly what is at stake so that there's no doubt in the public's mind what they're going to be voting for or voting against. Yeah, um, and just to be clear, the the issues revealed in the audit um, are being addressed um, now. It's not a failure to address them. It just takes a long time. I know, saying in the past. Yeah. Um, Helen. Yeah. Um, this is all very interesting. Um, but and I think we should have a press release. I agree with John. But right now, I would like to know if there are any other department heads who are here waiting. Yep, Jennifer is waiting next. Yes, so. and, and that our discussion, I think we all agreed at the last meeting that we discussed this, the two options, that Danny Silverman was right, that we should have both of them on the warrant. Mm -hmm. 
And whatever we feel about the pain of these cuts, it's got to go on the warrant. So let's please hear from the rest of, you know, not to drag this out in terms of staff having to stay up really late listening to us talk about things in a valuable way for us, but not necessarily for them. Thank you. Um, all right, so any other questions for uh, Suzanne regarding the human services? Okay, um, yeah, I mean that, I, I would just like to emphasize Suzanne's point that these are definitely something that young families rely on and the cost for, for childcare is exorbitant already, um, you know, um, and, and with that, I guess, um, to the library, Jennifer. Yes, thank you. Um, this is devastating for our department for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, it involves staff losing their job and um, it will also involve as a result our closing the library on Monday and in the summer half of the year, we're also closed on Sundays. So that means we'll be closed two days in a row for public that need to use our services. And that would be really unfortunate and um, detrimental for people that need those services. There are people that don't get computers anywhere else, photocopying, faxing, um, you know, regardless of the materials and, and all the other wonderful services that we have there are people that do business there and um, it would be very, very devastating to have to do this, but we won't have a, a, a choice. Okay. Um, and so what are some of the materials that would be um, lost as well as part of this? Oh, materials um, are books, Ebooks, audiobooks, um, DVDs, um, and uh, you know that that's basically what materials are. And our materials budget has to be nineteen point five percent of our overall operating budget. So when I reduce the operating budget, I can reduce the materials budget. Okay, um, and can you just speak to um, how some of the patrons utilize the library to basically provide assistance? Um, yes, there are patrons who come to the library who use our computers and who use it sort of as a home office if they have their own computer, who do, who do all kinds of business there. They're, they They do their taxes on our computers, they do uh, real estate deals on our computers. They, uh, that's their only source for email and for communication. Um, for, you can't apply for a job at Dunkin' Donuts without going on a computer now. Um, there are people who use it for school, um, for, for writing papers, for um, printing. Uh, we're the only place in town you can print. Um, and we're much less expensive than Staples. We're um, the only, you know, one of only a couple of places you can fax. We have a free scanner. So we have all of those, um, we have all of those services um, as well as a place for families to come and bring their children. A lot of um, older children come after school. Um, we are one of the only places open in the winter and it is going to be devastating to not have that available. Um, and we also provide a lot of entertainment and classes and educational opportunities and all of that will be lost at least one day a week. Okay, um, Mike. 
Yeah, I know this isn't part of the operating budget, but just in just to provide some context, how old are the computers in the library? Oh my goodness, some of them are going on 20 years old. Like I remember when they were new because I had just gotten out of high school like two years <laughs> before that. So yeah, there are some of them that are that old. There are some of them that are newer. And then there are some of them that have like a new monitor or CPU, but the keyboard, mouse, and other parts of it are still from, you know, or, or from a closet in town hall, from, you know, a staff member's discard. We have a lot of that going on as well. None of the youth computers work at all. So my point in bringing this up is really to emphasize the the fiscal conserv the how conservative we've been as a town fiscally mm -hmm. um, with our taxpayer dollars, and I, I just think it's important that people realize that um, that that we have run a tight ship as far as spending goes for a long time and deferred things like that. And so when we talk about cutting the library budget, um, we should put that into context with you know how how we've how we've sort of been frugal as a town to begin with. So this will be devastating for the town and it's personally devastating for me to even go through this exercise. And I just, just uh, to respond to John's point about not convincing each other, I'm certainly not trying to convince you, John, or anyone else. We're all voting for this. We all clearly believe that this I is mean, the Mike, so you're kind of getting off topic again. Sure, sorry um, about that. Um, all right. Um, well, thank you, Jennifer. Are there any other questions uh, for the library director? Okay. Um, so is uh, Becky Rosenberg on or Suzanne? If she's not, I don't see her, so. Suzanne, yes, uh, sir. Can, you, can you speak to the, the rec um, I can't. budget? Becky and I met with Charlie together um, yesterday about uh, our different budgets. And this Becky, uh, $19,000 will mean the elimination of extended day rec. So morning rec at Bakersfield will again be morning rec. It'll be nine to 12. There'll be no afternoon program from 12 to three, which accommodates children from ages five up for, for working parents. Um, and the other cut would be at the number of instructors at Gull Pond, which will impact the number of children that can be offered swimming lessons, which as we all know, the number of drownings in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has gone up each of the last two years. And it's a basic safety and health issue to make sure that local kids or kids who are here locally are able to keep themselves um, safe in the water. So it would be a huge hit on both fronts. Okay. Um, are there any questions? I don't know. I mean, this again, really impacts, you know, young families um, and the ability of those um, parents to, to, you know, work. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, portable uh, for your budgets, uh, the um, portable end of summer or portable toilets for the end of summer? Yes, they would be. The, traditionally, we've had portable toilets in place for one week following Labor Day weekend, and we would have to cut them off and have the last day be Labor Day. So during the shelter season, which is um, a very popular time and which the Chamber of Commerce uh, promotes heavily, we would not have facilities at the beaches for people. Okay. Um, and what about the, um, the beach houses? Would those still be open? Yes. The, uh, what Town of Wellfleet refers to as the comfort stations. Yeah. And the locations would be open usually until just before, uh, just after Columbus Day. Okay. Um, so this would be a lot of the, the portable toilets at the ponds? At um, the ponds and the, and the Bayside beaches where we have them, yes. Okay. All right. Um, and then um, for the beach um, budget? 
it would mean pulling all my staff off the beaches at approximately August 26th. So the last 10 days of the season would be um, unmanned. And unfortunately, by doing that, we're losing revenue for those last 10 days of the beach program. So I'm not sure it's a good trade, but it's the uh, it's where I could make a cut uh, as opposed to um, cutting safety equipment. Okay. Um, and would that, so would that include lifeguards as well? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and I know the answer to this, but um, <laughs> what is the most active time for uh, sharks in the area? August through November. Okay. So I think September's or early September is a, a big one too. Um, yeah, it starts getting busy mid-August, busy in terms of the number of sharks detected or who ping the buoys. Okay. Mid-August through, I would say the middle of October is probably the busiest eight weeks. Okay, <laughs> so this would be cutting staff during, you know, um, I, I would say in a time of that, that there's additional safety concerns. Uh, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And because the fiscal year starts on July 1st, um, is that why, like, would, would it make more, I mean, I know that obviously we're not hoping that this, you know, that the contingency budget is net, uh, is, necessary but would it make more sense to um reduce the re make the reduction earlier in the season rather than at the tail end uh well i hadn't thought about it from that point i i, I there's no time in the eight the eight busy weeks from fourth you know july 1st through the seventh week third week in august um, that I could reasonably pull the people off the beach because, I mean, the personnel off the beach because that's when the beaches have the most bodies on them. Uh, the only other place I could think about would be instead of starting the third Saturday in June, we could conceive in 2023, start the fourth Saturday in June, but that has also started to become a very busy season in June. So I'm not, com I'm not, I'm not comfortable pulling them off anytime. Yeah. But I was told to come up with a five or a 10% reduction and this is the way I can do it. I mean, I mean two and a half or five, I apologize. Yeah, I, I would like to keep lifeguards on the beach through at least the middle of September. Um, but, you know, <laughs> um, are there any, any questions for Suzanne? Okay, um, so I, I guess the, the last one is the group health insurance, which I guess is primarily from uh, the marina. Um, so Will Sullivan. Um, was on here. Yep, he's here. So um, chat. Technically, this this would be us reimbursing the the town. I mean, we are we are running level funded tech. I mean, on, on paper right now, but we are we are subsidized heavily by the town and the marina um, for the enterprise fund. Um, the 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 money for the, our health insurance to reimburse the town for our two full time employees, myself and and Mackenzie, um, that would would have to come directly out of our our seasonal. Uh, personnel budget and that would that would that would be a reduction in, in operating hours plain and simple um, complete I mean next week we start seven days a week and the, I mean there's already only two full-time employees and um, you know uh, we're, we're open pretty well now but but that would be that would be cut down that'd be cut down significantly um, ne never mind just the hours of being cut down we try to keep our seasonal staff into the fall to help us um, with the burden of, uh, you know, the docks, pulling them in, pulling them out, the maintenance in the spring. Um, 
you know, we, we've gotten a lot of help from the DPW, which we may have to see, you know, work on some cuts there. And it, it would basically go right into personnel, uh, upgrades, uh, maintenance, and, and staffing hours, um, which, would, which would therefore mean, um, you know, we're, we're not there as long in the evening. We're not there as long on the weekends. Um, and and that, that would mean that uh, once again, um, Chief uh, Polly and Chief Hurley's guys would be looking for me and, and women would be looking for me at home to, to come help. And, uh, you know, extra hour a day, I mean, sunset, you know, you, they're coming back eight, nine o'clock at night. You wouldn't be there. So that's exactly where it would come from. And, and that's the easiest line. I mean, there's, there's really nothing else to cut where we're so thin and we, we have a, such a crumbling infrastructure already. I mean, already each single dock to rebuild the lumber materials are, are, are so incredibly high. Never mind the, the other costs with the eight and a half to 9% inflation rate. Um, currently consumer index is, uh, you know, there's nowhere else to take it from. So that, that'd be the, that'd be the quickest shortfall. Okay. Are there any questions for Will? Okay. And, and so would it be a reduction in, in hours or would there be also additional times where the, the ramp might be closed as well? Um, the ramp would be open. We just wouldn't be there to staff it. Okay. All right. Um, Charlie. All right. Um, so, um, you know, I just want to thank all the department heads. Um, they've been just incredibly helpful and supportive. And um, here we go again. And, and you know, I, I think I just I'm always impressed with how they they um, assist and care about each other and support each other. And you can see that in the conversation tonight as well. So anyway, I think um, I, I, we, we need to finalize the warrant tonight. We've got to go to print. So we're gonna have to work our way through that. Now you may, um, if you were to adopt this modified budget, you still have a couple of weeks. You know, if you come up with some cuts in some other areas, we can amend it on town meeting floor if we come up with some other alternative as solutions. But we do need to get to a, a, a place where we can go to print tonight. Yep. Uh, Dan Silverman, town moderator. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, very briefly, um, having listened to this discussion um, tonight uh, was helpful for me because I think managing this discussion on uh, town uh, meeting uh, floor is going to be challenging at best. And I would urge the board and the department heads uh, to do as much work as possible between now and town meeting to educate the voters as to exactly what these uh, what the alternative budget <clears throat> would mean in terms of town services. Uh, I don't think uh, realistically there's going to be the opportunity at town meeting to have the kind of back and forth questioning um, that you engaged in tonight. I think there will certainly be the opportunity for each department head to explain uh, what the cuts would mean for their department. But uh, I, I would urge you to focus uh, your thinking, focus your comments uh, and do the work necessary between now in town meeting so that people have a very clear understanding of exactly what this would mean. I think to try to engage uh, in the, the, the kind of detailed discussion uh, that you had tonight on town meeting floor would be, will be challenging at best. Uh, so that, that would be my, you know, having, having been at town meeting for many years and been through many budget discussions, this is going to be a new experience for, for all of us. Um, so um, I, I, I really recommend strongly to the board that the bulk of the work in terms of educating the voters as to what this means uh, take place be, be between now and town meeting. So thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, Kathleen. Uh, yeah, good evening um, board um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I would suggest be, because there's so much detail 
um, in the contingency budget um, that perhaps you might engage with the uh, Wealthly Community Forum um, to hold a forum on, uh, on the two budgets so that people know well ahead in advance of town meeting, um, you know, the differences between the two. Um, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's pretty serious. Um, I, I think that um, it's been serious for um, the voters um, and it's certainly very uh, gonna be very detrimental, um, you know, uh, in the future for our department heads. Um, but everybody's done a great job with this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And I, I'm sure we'll look at, well, you know, I mean, we've discussed it somewhat in the past, but I'm sure that's something we'll look to do. Uh, John, but then we really need, do need to get to the warrant. I just wanted to say, I think that uh, Kathleen's suggestion is an excellent one. Uh, uh, in addition to uh, coming up with a press release, uh, even to the extent of having it printed up and keeping it with us as individual board members so that when we encounter members of the public, uh, uh, we, we should be willing to engage with them and maybe provide them with this information. Uh, we, have, we have a big PR job to do here. Okay, um, so on to the warrant. Um, so, if it, Article One's all set, right, Charlie? Yes. Okay, so Article Two, which is I don't we haven't voted on. Well, I, I know you voted on each line item. I don't know if you voted in in its totality, Ryan. Okay, so I move to insert and recommend. Um, the FY23, um, what is it? FY23 operating budget. Ellen second. Okay. Uh, can I have a roll call vote? Mr. Chairman, just yep. could we have brief discussion just so I understand, are we voting on both, are these two separate things, inserting it in the warrant and approving it? And if so, should we take those votes separately? So the, the individual line items have been previously approved um, by the board. I, it was, yeah. Um, in the, uh, in the, the contingency budget or in the, the original? Yeah. In the original budget. So oh, okay. I'm not sure what, what we should call this one, Charlie. Um, um, should it just be the operating budget or? Yeah, for fiscal 2023, yes. Okay. okay. Okay, I was confused. Thank you for the clarification. Yep. Okay, can I roll call vote? Is no, this no, I... To insert and recommend, yes? Yep. Michael, I. Barbara, I. Ryan, I. Ellen, I. Okay, motion carries 5 0. Um, the FY23 alternative budget plan, um, which we've just. Could we call it a contingency budget? Set of an alternative budget plan. Yes. Good. Yep. So, yes. uh, <laughs> so yeah, contingency budget. I yes, guess. Um, uh, so I move to insert um, the FY twenty three uh, contingency budget plan. Oh, one second. Okay. Okay. Roll call vote, please. John, I. Barbara, I. Michael, I. Ryan, I. Ellen, I. Okay. Um, we're not recommending it. I recommending. We're going to have a. We're going to have to have a vote on recommending it. So, um, I, I would actually move not to recommend uh, the FY twenty three contingency budget plan. Second. Second. Okay. Are we? So we're moving in the negative. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I means no. Yes. <laughs> Right. So, so the, no. the motion was not to recommend. So so I would mean not recommend it. Yes. Okay. Michael, I. John, I. Barbara, I. Ryan, I. Ellen, I. Okay, motion carries 5-0. That's going to be tricky with the minutes there. <laughs> I think it's just... I, I didn't want to make a motion to recommend it because I... I I just can't. Um, 
<laughs> it's semantic. I'm kidding. I, I'll get it. <laughs> so uh, the budget uh, Terry transfers. So it looks like there's a small amendment here, Charlie. Uh, okay, I am Jay. Give us a page, please. Is this article number three? Yeah, article number three. Page 19. Thank you. Okay, so so I move to amend uh, FY22 budgetary transfers um, as drafted. Okay. One second. Okay, uh, can I have a roll call vote? Aye. Um, Michael, aye. Ryan, aye. Barbara, aye. Ellen, aye. Um, yep. Just when we were going over one of the um, budget items, that's what we were talking about, right? Uh, the, in the contingency budget, the, um, sorry. Um, there was some recommendation that we remove something on both budgets. That was in the main article number one budget. That was, and did, but we did mean amend that though. So yeah. Yeah. We, we didn't, okay. we didn't amend that, but I can, I can work on that for the next meeting and we can do it okay. as an amendment right. on the, in the motion. I can work on that. Sorry, I just couldn't remember. I, I didn't want to mess up all the totals and everything at yeah. this point. Okay, fine. Because we're kind of, um, yeah, we're under the gun. Sure. But I, I will bring something back to the board with adjusted totals. Okay, that's fine. If that's okay. So then it looks like article five uh, is the police cruiser replacement. Which you have a bunch of punctuation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, if I could, it's it's okay for me to talk about Article Five then. Yes. Yep. Okay. So uh, what I've done here, I met with Lisa Sauve today, and um, I've um, gosh, I what I've done is I've gone back and looked at old appropriations. So I've made a number, I've corrected a number of typos, by the way, that I've found in this warrant. I, I, I kind of read it last night and then um, 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 Rebecca made those changes today. Lisa Sauve and I have found two old appropriations um, for, with uh, some monies that we can use to uh, fund the police cruiser replacements. And they're going to total one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Do you do you want the detail? I guess mm -mm. No. No. no, no. But I mean, I could get it if you want it. But <laughs> it's two old appropriations in the amount of um, one hundred and three thousand dollars for so a technology project that was never done, and seventeen thousand dollars from another um, article that we didn't spend the money on. So, you know, the, the beauty of it is. Uh, it won't, the cruises won't be subject to an override. Okay. Okay, so is it getting moved to a separate article? No, I'm gonna leave it right here, but in the funding source, I'll list the article in the town meeting date. And we'll have what the, the um, transfers are, what the original appropriations are from. Yep, I, I, I already have it built in here. I, I did it this afternoon. Okay, um, so it doesn't look like we have a recommendation. No, not yet on the total, right? Um, did we move to insert? I think we inserted it, correct? Yeah, I probably forgot to put that in, Ryan. Okay, um, just to be sure. Um, so I move to insert and recommend um, the FY23 capital budget. Oh, one second. Okay, uh, roll call vote, please. John, I. Barbara, I. Sorry, Barbara. Michael, I. Ryan, I. Ellen, I. Okay, motion carries five zero. And Ryan, so what's going to happen? I'm, when I start working on motions, some of this is going to be subject to an override. Uh, but anyway, you'll you'll see the yep. motions. That's my next project. So. Yeah, and, and so typically, a Wellfleet also ha usually has a motions booklet. Yeah. Um, for its town meeting as well. Um, I will. Yep. We will produce that, and Dan, uh, Dan Sullivan helps us with that a lot too. So, okay. So, Article Seven, Water Enterprise Fund budget. Um, we yeah we 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 voted to insert and recommend that. Um, yep. It was four one. 
Um, yes, and I wrote that down. Thanks. Okay. Um, please. I, I would have voted to insert it, but. Uh, I, I, okay. Hmm. Uh, communications. Let's see the collective bargaining agreements. That has to wait for recommendation till town meeting, still, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm involved, and in, I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, please. Okay. Uh, well, fleet floor are. Oh no, we voted on this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think. The, Does the it? Community? Oh, I'm going to go ahead and have site apologies. Yeah, so Article 19, the uh, Wealthy Flora and Fauna Survey. Um, the, mo the recommendation is uh, three votes, yay, with two abstentions. Are there, does anybody want to um, have a new vote on that or not? No. Uh, I think I was an abstention at that point. Okay. I just wasn't sure if it could wait until the next town meeting. I still am not quite clear. Okay. And, and frankly, the way that we've been talking about that, if you look at my spreadsheet on all the warrant articles, this is one of those things that would be subject if we get free cash certified. Um, if we don't, then it's going to have to wait till the fall. There's a number of articles that are in that category. Right. Okay. So in that case, I would, I would, move to change the recommendation, to reconsider the recommendation. Hold on, uh, Helen second for the sake of discussion. Yep. Okay, so we went over and to include Barbara now, getting a baseline on this stuff, things are changing so fast with climate change and the temperature of the water in the harbor, for example, and species being affected that having a baseline on this is much more time sensitive than it was five years ago or six years ago. And that's one of the reasons it's, you know, in this very tight year coming up, we put it off last year, but this assessment and the last time it was done was ages ago, you know, it was called the Curley Report. Anyway, it's been talked about a lot and I certainly hope given uh, the shellfishing industry in the harbor and how big it is in the economy of the town um, that we do that this year and that we don't put it off again. Things are changing too fast. Thank you. Okay, so the motion is has been made. Was it seconded to reconsider? Yes. Yeah. Okay, can I roll call vote on the reconsideration? I move that we reconsider this. Oh. The oh, motion has been made and seconded. I need a roll call vote on the reconsideration. Yes. Barbara, aye. Aye. Barbara, aye. Okay, I, I move to recommend Article 19, the Wellfleet Harbor Floor and Fauna Survey. Helen second. Okay, can I roll call vote? John, aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Ryan, aye. Helen, aye. Okay. And I voted aye on the previous one. Just what's the previous one, Helen? To reconsider. I, I you didn't get my vote. No, I got it. Okay. Okay. Um shellfish revolving fund. I'm assuming that it should actually have one abstention. Yes. Uh, from the from the select board. Oh. Um, oh okay. Oh, okay. I'll change that to abstention, right? Yep. And that what I remember that I, I just didn't put it in properly. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the community preservation fund articles. It looks like we still need to make recommendations on all of them. Yeah. Page. And, yeah. Lisa hasn't finished that task yet, so. I, I would still, I would want to make a recommendation. Okay, subject to the funding, sure. Yep. Yep, okay. Um, so I, I move to recommend articles 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 
33, 34? No. 34, yep. The Wellfleet Elementary School Playground? Yep, that's that's from the Community Preservation Fund. Okay, well, it doesn't say so at the beginning, but never mind. They're Second. all under the heading, Helen. Michael second. Okay. Um, it, can I have a roll call vote or any discussion? John, aye. Okay. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Brian, aye. Helen, aye. Okay, motion carries five zero. Uh, disposition. We voted on this already. Yeah, I'm looking, sorry. So it looks like 36, we have highlighted Charlie, but we already have votes recorded for that. Um, 30, 36? Yeah, the affordable housing trust bylaw amendment. Yeah, don't, don't I have your votes in there? Yeah, it's just highlighted. Oh, yeah, and I, I've eliminated that today. I caught that last night. Okay. So I have a five zero zero on that. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, animal control bylaw. Oh, yes. Um, so. Hello? Uh, yeah, one second, Helen. So we've put, we've moved basically every bylaw we can to the fall town meeting warrant. Um, the, the one exception is the zoning uh, bylaw or ones that have been petitioned. Um, I, I think that many of those other bylaws were as worthy or, or more pressing than, than amending the animal control bylaw might be. Um, and I just think we'd be best served to, to you know, continue the restraint to focus this town meeting on financial articles rather than getting into uh, what, you know, a debate about animal control bylaw revisions, but Helen? Yeah, so um, one of them we have to do, we were told to do it last spring by town council, and that's an easy one. You see that there was an enclosed letter from town council where we did not, last year uh, delete the section that is now redundant. Um, and that's just a simple housekeeping thing. The other issue is, and the animal control officer requested uh, having the leave the animals in the vehicles unattended be less restrictive and to echo the state's law, which he is now, all the animal control officers are now applying the state's law, whatever there is on the books here. Only problem is what he wanted last year is stricter than the state's law. It says you can't ever leave an animal unattended at any time of year. That's what you drafted, Helen. No, so. he, I didn't stop it. Ryan, you've said this now four times and it's inaccurate. The animal control officer wanted things. I supplied language, he adjusted it. I drafted that in. Don't say I drafted it. He wanted it. Okay. You so said you drafted it. <laughs> I put, I did the drafting task with him together on the phone. And you're being disrespectful of the animal control officer's needs, in my opinion. And trivializing this, trivializing what he has to enforce is I'm not sure appropriate here. The only reason it's on, on the warrant right now in this, you know, for this coming annual town meeting is because he has to do this all the time. And it's important that he can enforce in the way that he needs to. And that is appropriate in terms of the state's requirements, the state's laws, the state's regulations. What has been bumped, which I didn't drop the ball on, was what he had asked for in terms of feeding coyotes, feeding wildlife. And that, you know, can be put on the fall warrant. You know, it's not going to make it obviously onto this one. But at the very least, we have to do the simple thing of deleting that leash by law. And, you know, there's summaries here. It's a simple housekeeping thing. And why we couldn't make 
these few amendments that you know he would like that are necessary on this warrant, I don't know. It should have happened last year, and you know what happened. We didn't hear from town council until after town meeting. So what's the will of the rest of the board, Ryan? I hear what you say, and I understand it. And we've been very good about, uh, we've been very good about cleaning this warrant up to focus on the finances. Mike, you have your hand up. Yeah, I would just say that the it doesn't matter if there's a redundancy right now. It can wait until the fall. And then the other issue is that because the redundancy is not a conflicting regulation. And the other issue is that like enforcing the a vehicle in vehicles, I'm assuming through the summer is the time when you can't have any leave your animals in your vehicle in both bylaws. So I don't think it's gonna have any impact until the fall anyways, when we loosen that, if we decide to loosen that regulation. So I don't see any need to keep this in here right now. Yeah, and just to be clear, it, there's a number of other changes throughout the bylaw that differs from our current bylaw as well. Yes, um, and they're indicated. And no, they're not. I, uh, I, they are in italics. No, I went through more everything. than that, Helen, I, I can send you the highlighted copies of the current bylaw with this, compared to this proposed bylaw. Ryan? Um, yeah. Point of order, uh, Chair. Yep. Point of order. Point of order, I would like to stay on topic and I would like to make a motion to move this to the fall town meeting. Second. Okay. Second. Can I have a roll call vote? Ryan, aye. Michael, aye. Ryan, aye. Barbara, aye. Helen, are you abstaining or voting in the negative? Helen, nay. And I'm very sorry about this because- Okay, we need to move on, Helen. That's I'm an sorry. the needs of one of our police officers. Thank you. Okay. Um... Charlie, is the the um for the the community impact fees and the stabilize the housing stabilization funds? Um, is this warrant with the updated language supplied by town council? I don't think so, because I think John Giorgio gave it to me. I think it was Wednesday. Or okay. Thursday, right? Hang on. Um, let me let me show you what I have and see if it matches what you have. Yeah, I, I feel like we did incorporate it, but I'm. Um, I think you're right. Um, no, or at least what's posted online doesn't. All right, can we just bring it up into the screen? Is there an amended version? Yeah. Just bring it up on the screen. We can we can vote that one in, and then we can drop it. Charlie can, or Rebecca can drop it in. Oh, that one's worse. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm sorry, because this was from last week when we put your package together. You're right. Okay, uh, screen two. And, and John sent it to us on Sunday and we sent it out. There it is. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Or oh, Ryan. <laughs> not super substantive changes. So I would just move to uh, place and re recommend the Article 45 Affordable Housing Stabilization Fund as amended by town council. I would second that, but then uh, Barbara. Um, yeah, I guess was it town council's advice to do this together rather than have separate articles to establish a housing stabilization fund and then a separate article on appropriating. Is this what was recommended? So there's two different housing stabilization funds. Yeah. Um, they're both special purpose funds. So we have okay. to have a town meeting vote to create them. Right. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then it, it includes the, the appropriations from the community impact fees um, in the, the language that establishes the stabilization funds. Um, the language to um, 
adopt both the local options has, has to be handled separately from that as well um, in the order that they appear as well. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, uh, okay. Sorry. No, it's fine, it's, I get it. Okay, so uh, can I have a roll, roll call vote on the motion? Was it seconded? Yes. Okay. My, uh, Ryan, I. Michael, I. Barbara, I. I'm waiting for John. I was vote left. John voted first. I heard him. I didn't. Helen, I. Okay. Can we vote in order, please? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we did actually. Except Barbara, it was. Oh, is yeah. there an order? I'm sorry. It, no, it's just the order we've been following. John, oh. Barbara, Michael, Ryan, Helen. That's just seems okay. yeah, it's, it's on Janet, Michael, Ryan, Helen. So when, when Mike, that's why like if Mike's voting or recused himself from a vote, um, I'm usually like, I don't know, it takes me a minute or two. <laughs> so no, I like having an order, an order's good. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, this is uh, the mixed income. Um, housing stabilization fund. It should probably say how, uh, Charlie. It should it should say mixed income housing stabilization fund as well. Right now, it only says mixed income stabilization fund. Okay. In the updated warrant, I, it does say that the one that okay. I already implemented this into the warrant that I did today, actually. Okay. okay. I move to uh, insert and recommend Article Number Forty Six, Mixed Income Housing Stabilization Fund, as amended by Town Council. Helen, second. Okay. Can I roll call vote? John, no, I. Barbara, I. Michael, I. Ryan, I. Helen, I. Okay, motion carries five zero. Um, so 47, uh, it's mostly changes the name um, and then updates the summary. So I, I guess I move to amend article 47 as, um, as drafted. Um, you just, Helen second, but yep. question. So yep. Ryan, you just referred to amendments in article 47. I it's, see no attack. It's on the screen, Helen. Oh, I'm looking at my warrant. I see the amendments, they're in red. Got it. Okay. No, no, I. Barbara, I. Michael, I. Oh, sorry. Ryan, I. Helen, I. Okay, motion carries five zero. Um, and then uh, Article 48. Um, so I move to amend Article 48 um, as drafted. Helen second. Okay, can I roll call vote? John, I. Barbara, I. Michael, I. Ryan, I. Helen, I. Okay. All right, back to the warrant. Um, uh, standard annual, we've done it. Yeah. Okay, I think did we're we, done uh, with the uh, warrant. Did we do a recommendation on tree preservation? Yes, we did. Oh yes, insert yes, recommend. No. No, okay. Um, so um, we have to finalize the, the special election ballot. Um, <laughs> Ryan, is it would it be okay for Rebecca to put that screen up that showed since we're talking about the override questions, for her to put that third page up to answer John's question, um, and to show the public what these overrides impacts sure. would be. Sure. Rebecca, could you do that, please? Yep. Give me one sec. I just got to pull it up. Yeah, sorry that wasn't in your package. I, I only saw it when I got home and I was prepping for the meeting. So, but it, it's not any different than you've seen or I've presented recently. But that, that's it. Thank you. 
Okay, um, so if you look at this third page of the financial projection, um, and then you go down to section B, where it says list of property tax overrides, FY23, item number one, it shows the town, and I call it uh, town and school general override. That's at $518,820. That would, um, I I'm, I'm, I'm can't quite see the last column. Uh, there it is. That would uh, result in a, this is on, on an average tax bill without the, um, um, uh, I'm missing a word here, but anyway, it would be an average tax bill and it would be $114.84 on the average home at $618,750. Um, and then, so that would be um, question one. Um, and so we should probably de deal with them one at a time, Ryan. Okay. Um, or, or do you want me to go through? So that number, that 518820 would go in this ballot question. Can you move it over back for a minute, please? 518820, where is that? Right. Oh, and that, if that comes right from the front page that we talked about earlier. Right. That's the town and the school override. Yeah, I, I, you know, the school really doesn't need any money, but I, I list it as a general municipal override. So, okay, okay, yeah. So next one. Okay, then question number two um, is the the capital special projects I call it, and. Um, so first, let me look at the spreadsheet. Number two, that's six hundred seventy-two thousand seven hundred dollars. That that was the number that we talked about earlier. And as we scan across, that would that override would cost the average taxpayer one hundred and forty-eight dollars and ninety-one cents. Now, um, so that six seventy-two uh, seven hundred. Would, would go into that blank under question number two, all right? Now, the only other thing I want to do under question number two is since the board had talked about some of this money would be used for OPEB, you know, other post-employment um, benefits, mm -hmm. I wanna put that, that uh, word in, in, in the, uh, the detail of the question. So when you vote and consider this, I would ask, that you recognize it, an amendment to put OPEB in there. All right. Mm -hmm. And then question number three is for the, um, uh, the two new police officers. That's $186,759. I've already built that into the question that you're looking at. And that cost impact would be the $41.34. And then, um, and as I say, I already built that in. And then question number four is the two new firefighter paramedics. Um, that's $206,964. By the way, that includes wages, benefits, uh, related cost. That would be the $45.81. And then um, question number five is a is a little bit different. That's a debt exclusion. Um, that's the two million two hundred thousand dollars for the fire suppression system at the Wellfleet Elementary School. And and as I've estimated that, I'm going to borrow it for twenty years. So you can see that annual expense, the one eighty seven two eighty. And um, that's a decline. It's going to be a declining debt situation each year, but the first year's impact will be the forty-one dollars and forty-six cents. So those are the cost impacts to the override questions that you need to finalize tonight. And, 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 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. The total impact then on the individual average taxpayer would be 549.91. Yeah, minus the 385 because we didn't include the funding for the shellfish um, position in, in, in the budget or, or the override. So it'll be slightly less. Okay, what's the uh, 618.75 from? Um, I asked the town. Oh, so that's a median home. Yeah, that's a median. Okay. Yes, yeah. And so, anyway, by the way, to John's question, the if I eliminate the shellfish position, it would be the total would be five hundred forty-six dollars and six cents as an estimate. Yeah, how much? Uh, five hundred. Forty-six dollars and six cents. Okay. Okay, and so th with the um, the increase in the residential exemption um, has an effective uh, <coughs> tax rate reduction of I, I forget how much I calculated it out to, but somewhere around like four point five percent. Yeah. Um, for uh, a, a resident of the town. Um, so, um, yeah, um, and then the, um, the, the school fire suppression debt, ex debt exclusion, um, I'm assuming, all right, that's the annual expense. Okay. Um, yes. Mike. Yeah. I was just going to ask if there's a way that we can get the calculation on the, uh, the total cost for a resident with the tax exemption. Just yeah, so we get that information too, I think it's pertinent. Yeah, I can do that. Right. Yeah, Ryan can help me with that, and I can <laughs> so, play with that. Yeah, yeah. it's a complicated equation. Yeah, and I I never used it before. I, I think it's wonderful you have it. But oh. anyway, yeah. Yeah, I, I I provided a worksheet to uh, the tax assessor as well. So. Okay. Yeah, I think you gave it to me, but I'll have to. Yeah. Okay. Now, just uh, just for one more piece of information, questions one, two, three, and four are general overrides. So they're gonna re require a majority vote by the select board to add it to the town election warrant. And um, question number five is a debt exclusion. That's gonna require a two thirds vote by the select board. So it'd be four out of five select board members would have to vote to approve to put that on the warrant. Which one? Uh, question number five is a debt exclusion. Okay. So it's a, it's a higher vote requirement. Brian? Yep, Helen? Um, uh, through you to Barbara. Barbara, um, this one thing is something that's legally required and we have to do it, unfortunately. It's not like a frill. Thank you. Um, the, the fire chief was has gone through it. You know, it's it's really, you know, we've been inform, fully informed about it. Okay, I, I didn't realize I had raised an issue. Um, you hadn't. <laughs> I was just trying to make sure that you were up to speed on the, that I case. That. You were oh, no, yes, that was my, yes, that was my assumption, but thank you. Okay. Um, so Charlie, should we do the the motions to to? Um, I, I think uh, you should vote on each question one at a time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't want someone to challenge, you know, uh, procedural steps later on. So. And would it be to insert? Yes. Uh, let me to see. The ballot. It Two. would be. Uh, uh, a majority vote by the select board is needed to place an override question on the ballot. Okay, I, I move to place question one on the um... special town election warrant. Mm. Yeah. Exp Excuse ballot. Me. ballot. Ballot. Well, there's a typo in the. It's it's ballot. Okay, I oh, just said ballot. There's well, it says warrant on my piece of paper, so. Good catch. That's ballot, correct, Charlie? Ballot. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's how it is in the packet. Uh, so I, I move to insert 
um, question one into the uh, June 21st, uh, 2022 special election ballot. Now one second. Okay, roll call vote, please. On aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Ryan, I. Helen, I. Okay, I move to insert uh, question two um, into the June 21st, 2022 special election ballot. And did you include in your motion the adding the OPEB language? Uh, which one? For question number two. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so it, it's. <coughs> Plus. Sorry. So. Bless you. What so would gonna, it called? Excuse me. What would the language be? Um, I think we could put leave it uh, for the purpose of funding equipment replacement, facility repairs, comma special projects, and other post employment benefit expenses for fiscal year beginning July first, two thousand twenty two. Okay, uh, so moved. Alan second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Helen, aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Ryan, aye. Helen, aye. Okay, I move to insert uh, question three into the um, June 21st, 2022 special election ballot. Helen, second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Helen, aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Ryan, aye. Illinois. Okay, um, I move to insert uh, question four into the June 21st, 2022 special election ballot. Ellen second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Ellen I. Barbara I. Michael I. Ryan I. Ellen I. Okay, um, and I move to insert um, question five um, into the June 21st, 2022 special election ballot. Helen second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Helen and I. Barbara, I. Michael, I. Ryan, I. Helen, I. Okay. Um, Good. Is that it for the, the special election ballot, Charlie? Yes. Okay. So, um, um, uh, did, yeah. uh, we voted on each question. Is that what we just did? Yes. Yeah. So we should vote to uh, close and post the, the ballot in its totality. Okay. I, I moved to, oh, we, we also didn't, uh, close and post, um, the warrant either. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let, let's do the ballot first and then we'll go back to the Warrant. So I, I move to close and post um, the June 21st, 2022 special election ballot. Ellen second. Okay, roll call vote. Not I. Barbara, I. Mike, and I. I. Oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> it's getting late. Hmm. Helen? Ryan, did you vote? Yep. Helen, I. Okay. Um, so I, I move to. Uh, close and post uh, the uh, 2022 um, annual town meeting warrant. Helen second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Helen I. Barbara I. Michael I. Ryan I. Helen I. Okay, um, so we have one more item of business that we need to do tonight. Um, and then um, the other items, on under the business agenda, I've actually asked already to be posted for the uh, meeting we'll be having um, next week. Um, so um, yeah, because um, yeah, it's getting late, and I I figured it was going to. Um, so we have to extend Charlie's, uh, uh, Charlie Sumner's employment contract with the town of Wellfleet. Um, it currently expires, um, I believe next week, correct, Charlie? Yes, yeah, I think it, 
I think it's on the 14th off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay. How much are, how long are we extending it? Uh, through May 30th. Um, okay. And uh, Rich Waldo starts on, Charlie, can you, sorry, I don't have it written down in front of me. Yeah, Tuesday after um, on Memorial Day. Um, May 31st. Yeah. Yep. Thank so you. May 31st. The chair through you. Yep. Charlie, will you be also uh, helping, uh, consulting with Rich uh, um, to transition? Yeah, I'd like to, and I'd, I'd like to work through town meeting or a little bit after, but what I'll do is I'll sit down with Rich and um, I'll just work out some type of a contractual agreement um, to provide some temporary consulting services or something. So whatever Rich and the board wants, but I, at a minimum, I would see that probably through the middle of June. I'd, I'd like to go to town meeting, answer any questions about everything. And then, um, and then I'd like to do the report work with the town clerk to finalize the report of town meeting. So everything will be ready to submit to the department of revenue in the fall. So yeah, so that, if that that's sort of what I ideally like to do. So very you, much appreciate you can decide that. if you want me to do it. So. <laughs> Please, Charlie. <laughs> okay, uh, Helen, you had your hand up. No, I took it down. Um, that was the question I was going to ask. Okay, uh, so I move to approve the extension of interim town administrator Charlie Sumner's employment contract uh, with the town well fleet to go through May thirtieth, twenty twenty two. Helen second. Okay, roll call vote, please. Hmm, let me think of it. Aye. <laughs> Barb, Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Ryan, aye. Sorry. Michael, aye. You know, you know I, I'll just, I know it's late, but um, it, it has been a year. I, I never thought I'd be here a year, honestly, but um, <laughs> um, and it, it, it's, it's certainly been more demanding than I had ever envisioned, but I, I really appreciate you know the board support and and all the employees that it, it's been a gratifying experience for me and i just wanted to mention that so well we owe you a huge debt of gratitude charlie hey charlie can i pick up a copy of that tax uh, sheet tomorrow yes yep i'll be in at um 8 30. i okay. won't <laughs> um well, I'll, I'll wait for you. <laughs> so, select board reports. I had one, and I can't for the life of me remember what it was. So I have one. Okay. I'm going to do reactions, and there we go. I have one. Yep. I'll keep it brief. I had a couple, but the main one is this. Um, you all got an email, which will go into correspondence, that was a report from me um, that I'm not going to read out, but the report is included in that correspondence. And, you know, maybe I should read it out. Oh, no, I'll summarize it. So after the last hearing about ARC, um, more was discovered about what is in our regulations and where there should be a regulation that would offer the option of the select board allowing a combination um, license for aquaculture and uh, uh, research and development. And it was drafted with input from the DMF, more than one person there. It's all listed in this uh, correspondence report. Um, and town council, Greg Corbo and Nancy Chavetta, and then I did some on it too. And um, the final draft of that was finished today and it can be posted tomorrow and included in that hearing. Because if you remember during that hearing, um, this was promised and it's great because we've finally gotten to the bottom of what might be a position for ARC to have if they were allowed to come in under this regulation, which we may or may not want to do. But the regulation is something good to have on the books and we can do it locally. I'm also going to copy you with correspondence from the DMF from Chrissy Pettibus, who's their 
senior biologist. You know, she took over from Chris Galachi, you took over from um, Michael Hickey. And um, this was good news. It was a lot of hard work, but I'm excited to know what the rest of the board thinks about it. And I let's please post it for the hearing. Although it could come in even without changing the posting because the section that it comes in under is included in the advertisement. Um, anyway, so that's my oh. report. And then I will say something else about other things at another meeting. Yeah, I, it's, it's not going to get posted for that hearing, so. Well, wait, can we hear from the rest of the board? Because it was no. proposed. Yes. No, Helen. It's too late to make the newspaper deadline at this point. It doesn't have to. It, our, our shell fishing regs require 14 days, so. Uh, it, th tomorrow is the last day. No. Yes. Both names. Fourteen days. Yeah. The the and the SAB hasn't even discussed it yet. They're going to discuss it tomorrow. Yeah, it's I not going to be on the twenty fourth. We we are overloaded for that meeting already. I can tell you that much. Well, I have a question about that then, and this goes into a future discussion. But do we want to hear Charlie's report first? Um, I I have um. What a report, um, actually, so Chief Early reminded me what, what it was. Um, so um, I attended a meeting of, with um, Chief Early, um, uh, Suzanne Thomas, um, DPW staff, a number of others, um, including fire department and with the, um, the new head ranger. Um, for for the national seashore um and the seashore and he expressed a willingness to for the seashore to to uh partner with the town in addressing some of the issues some of the issues we're encountering at Cahoon hollow um and he said that it's possible that the superintendent um could enforce um a no alcohol uh, policy under something called the superintendent's compendium of the seashore. Um, and, and that would address some of the, the difficulties that we experience with having two sets of regulations um, down at that beach. Um, and that's pretty much all. So for, for right now, for me. Okay. Anything else, uh, Charlie? Um, just I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, we did receive a notice um, a couple of days ago from the Mass Department of Transportation, and um, the state has provided funding. It's called the 2022 Winter Recovery Assistance Program uh, to provide monies to Massachusetts communities for road maintenance uh, issues and Wellfleet will be receiving $180,150. Certainly good news. Um, so that's nice. Um, and I just wanted, I've been getting a number of emails from citizens on the Herring River Restoration Project. And, you know, you know, we have received a grant award for $29 million, essentially towards um, the 75% project costs. And the town is eligible for the balance uh, uh, of 25 percent, and um, and 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 I have received some citizen emails and calls uh, concerned about the town's ability to finance that 25 percent cost, and and we do not have anything in the warrant for funding of that. We don't have any money uh, available to fund that. Uh, the all the efforts by the uh, team that's working on this important project are focused on getting other grants and gifts to uh, provide that town's match. Um, so they're making good progress. They've um, recently received some funding. They're working on a num another other venues for funding. Um, but I, I, I just wanted to mention that. Um, and relative to the cable TV uh, installation project, you know, for the hybrid meetings, um, there's gonna be a lot of work going on at the adult learning center next week. 
Um, and um, I think um, by the end of the week, we will have equipment up and functioning so that we can have hybrid meetings uh, in Wellfleet. It, you know, um, I'll keep you informed, but we're making really good progress. And then um, I'll just say briefly, I have been engaged in collective bargaining negotiations with a number of the bargaining units. And it's, um, um, it's my goal to have some proposals ready to present to the board and ultimately town meeting uh, because most of the collective bargaining agreements expire on July 1st, 2022. Um, and I had mentioned already earlier, um, someone had asked, but Lisa, Mary, and I will be meeting multiple times this week. Uh, we have a few issues we're dealing with closing out FY20, uh, but we're very, very close. And, um, you know, um, I'll, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have some good news in that front very, very soon. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we've had uh, some folks out on leave, some folks out on vacation in the select board town administrator's office. And then I frankly was away last week and only could work half days. So I just wanted to um, thank Rebecca Eldridge because um, she's done it all and um, flawlessly. And um, I just really wanna thank her for all the work that she's done to get this warrant uh, put together under a lot of pressure, so. Are there any questions for Charlie? Well, thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Um, sorry. Where, where are we? Future Topic, discussion. Topics for future discussion. Uh, so I also included a, a list of outstanding um, agenda items um, in our packet as well. Um, you did? Just so that, yeah. Well, oh, good. All right. Did I? I, thought I, did. I didn't see it. I just saw, if you send them to me, I'll, I'll get them written out. Oh, I thought I had included it. All right. Yeah, I thought so too, but I didn't see it. All right. So uh, I'll send that to the rest of the board um, after tonight. Um, Helen? You're muted, by the way. Rebecca, why why am I why have I been muted twice? You're probably. I don't know. I don't mute you. Yeah, I don't mute me either. Okay, I'm hungry and tired, but um, since uh, the chair has adamantly said that although there's enough time to do it, um. We're not going to have this new regulation um, on the 24th. I hope that we will have it on a, the meeting after that, um, because it would be something that would be to the town's advantage in terms of the industry and the fishery. If the FSAB has finished its review of the, um, I've already indicated this, once the SAB has finished reviewing the proposed regulations, um, then I'll look towards scheduling a public hearing for them. Not to have a discussion about it, but of course we have to wait for that. And I'm always an advocate for that, okay? Which they haven't even taken these up till tomorrow. Yes, I know. Yeah, okay, Helen. So um, yeah, the May 24th meeting, just so people are aware, we're gonna have around five uh, minimum productivity appeals. Um, it's going to be in person. Um, it's going to be the first meeting in person at the COA. Um, there's a donation of five parcels of land um, from an estate to the town. Um, there is a, a public hearing for amending the beach rules and regulations. Um, um, there's a, a authorization for the police department to seek a grant. Um, instructions um, tell their public bodies on meeting in person. Amendments um, basically to the, as earlier, as Charlie brought up earlier, um, some of the articles will be amended as we go through the process. Um, probably some financial updates. Rebecca Arnoldi's um, um, applications for the use of town property, which could be complicated. 
um, the shellfish appeal uh, form, which I might move to June, uh, public hearing on license number 792, which is also subject to the minimum productivity um, appeals. Um, and then I guess uh, press release um, regarding the town's um, budget and, and financial plans, and then whatever else we need to accomplish in that week. It's public hearing on the Fox and Crow. Uh, well, no, that's well for the yeah for the liquor license. Um, and um, may, maybe collective bargaining. Yeah. So there is literally no time for a debate on a on, especially if it's in person for shellfish regulation changes that might take, you know, an hour and a half um, because it is a public hearing and it will be in person. Um, on that on that meeting, so I just want to make that clear right now, um, and that's why. Okay. Um, so new business, there isn't any uh, correspondence of vacancy. Um, correspondence, there is the uh, email I sent out with uh, information this afternoon. Okay. Um, and then um, there, um, Rebecca, we'll have to work on getting uh, the vacancy reports um, as well. I am working on that actually right now. So you should have one by your next meeting. Okay. Um, and the other thing that we have to start thinking about is, is notifying anybody with expiring terms. Um, to get their, their papers and if they wish to continue on. Um, I am on that as well. I'm okay. going down the list to make sure all the members listed are the actual members in the group. And then I'm going with Jennifer Conjol to figure out when they were sworn in and when their term ends. Okay, and also Jeannie's list didn't include all the various boards and committees. Um, I can do that too. Okay, so you should probably check this, the list of special municipal employees. Um, I think that covers most of them. All right. Okay, so uh, anything or some minutes? Oh, actually there was a bit of correspondence I, I wanted to bring up. So um, the, um, the town received a, a grant um, or an appropriation from the state um, for the wastewater treatment facility for 95 Lawrence Road, and they fully funded that project. Um, it's uh, 2.75 million, I believe. Um, and yeah, I, it, that, that includes both the, um, the expected contribution for the developer of the affordable housing um, or the, for the housing project that's going in there, as well as the town's portion um, for the um, for the facilities to service, you know, the school, the the, the fire and police station. Um, so it is a, I mean, it is a a definite um, significant. Um, yeah, it is very significant for the town. So Helen. Yeah. Um. I was there. No correspondence from an abutter to the culvert um, that's near the flying fish that goes from upper pole dike, you know, marsh um, east past um, the box lunch. Was there no letter from an, an abutter about the fact that that needs to be repaired in our correspondence? I don't think for this week. And I mean, there was one like two months ago, I want to say. Yeah, um, that seems pretty important because the person's property is being impacted, damaged. So I just wondered if there was anything, I, I heard that there, the person might write, write in. So I don't know, okay. If it's not in correspondence, we can't discuss it now anyway. Yeah. The only thing I would say, if I could, is that we do have an item on the warrant for the design cost, I believe, for that culvert. So, are you sure it's the same one that I'm referring to? Um, 
the one well, that, that goes from you know it, it's right near the box yeah, J yeah. came in and presented on it yeah yeah that's right thank you bye okay so minutes uh, does anybody have any issues with minutes from may 12th or not may 12th april 12th Okay, uh, I didn't notice any issue. Um, so I move to approve the minutes of April 12th, 2022 as uh, printed in the packet. I'm second. Okay. Um, can I have a roll call vote? No, no, I. Barbara abstain. Michael, I. Brian, I. Helen abstain. Okay, motion carries three. With two, uh, three zero with two abstentions. Um, so, um, mm. yeah, um, before we adjourn, how are you holding up, Barbara? I'm just fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, there was, I, oh, I'm, we, I think we meant to cover it during the uh, reorganization. Um, I, you had some concerns about the, the meeting schedule? Um, so yes, thank you for bringing it up. I, um, I fairly regularly um, am invited to or asked to attend Toro select board meetings if there's an item related to land use or something else I'm working on. Um, Right now, the the meeting schedule for this Truro Select Board is the same as this board. Um, and although they start earlier, they start at 5 p.m. So I think if if it's possible to 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 stagger, um, if 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 board members are receptive to this. Um, to, to kind of minimize conflicts, um, to stagger, keep meetings on Tuesdays, but maybe have them the alternate Tuesdays. Right now we're meeting, you know, both boards are meeting quite a bit, so it's kind of hard to see, but I think ideally if the regular meeting schedule were first and third rather than second and fourth, there might be fewer conflicts. Um, if that doesn't work, I think I have some flexibility because their meetings start earlier um, and I could probably attend agenda items there and then attend here, but I, I would just hope that the, the board members would con consider that modification if possible. Um, Helen? I would support that. Um, you know, it, it makes sense to me and the first and third Tuesdays are, you know, just as good. Okay. Um, Mike? Yeah, I'm fine with that. I mean, Half the time we meet every Tuesday anyway, so no, <laughs> right. which right. it is, which <laughs> so right. I, I would be all right with that. I, I don't have a problem with it. Okay, and Barbara, what's a good alternate day if we have one of those weeks? Um, um uh, th Thursday or Friday, um, and Mondays sometimes the the ZBA meets once a month. So three out of four Mondays, I could make it, um, but there's no conflicts on Thursdays. Okay, I, I don't like doing Friday night. Meetings. Yeah, oh no, I don't either. I just know that there was one last week. So yeah. I, I would be very happy if there were no Friday meetings. Um, so um, for the other board members, does Thursdays work well for alternate um, meeting days? If when John, your uh, can you unmute? Yeah, mm -hmm. can you get John, Rebecca? Yeah, John. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I missed part of that because I lost my internet connection. But it sounds like uh, uh, we want to do uh, possible alternate meetings on Thursdays when uh, Barbara can't make it. Um. So there's a conflict with the Toro Select Board meeting on the same dates that we currently do on Tuesdays. Um, so Barbara asked us if we would consider, you know, changing it up so that we meet 
basically uh, the opposite days of their schedule. So I think we would be meeting the, the first Tuesday and the, the third Tuesday of each month. Is that correct, Barbara? Sounds right. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we have had to be meeting more often than that. Um, so, you know, I, I do need like a, a day that I guess is more likely than not to work with other people. Um, otherwise, it becomes really challenging to, to get everybody um, to I think agree on a day. For yep. me, I, I, I carve out Tuesdays just because it's like, I, it's just the day that I kind of carve out. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for me to be able to meet on an alternate Tuesday right. um, regardless. But, right. um, but, you know, when we have meetings, if we can just do those on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. that would be better for me when they're alternate because mm -hmm. I have just tides to contend with really. So sometimes I can meet like later in the week, sometimes I can't. I mean, I, I could see, uh, I mean, there are going to be plenty of weeks when we have additional Tuesday meetings and I can work it out. Um, just again, by trying to attend the Turo Select Board meeting earlier um, since they start at five, but for anything that can't work on Tuesdays, then, um, then Thursday's fine, but I will always try to make it work on a Tuesday. John? Yeah, I uh, I kind of would lean toward doing it on a case by case basis, but uh, uh, is there some reason Wednesdays wouldn't be viable? Um, that I the planning board consistently has meetings on Wednesdays, two or three a month. Um, so well, I, I, yeah, I can I can probably work with Thursdays, although doing it case by case might yeah. be. Better, yeah. But. Okay. Um, and so our first meeting in June then would, rather than being June 14th, would be June 7th. Great. Okay, Helen? Yeah, I was just gonna say something, which is we also have, um, you know, like CONSCOM meetings that often this members of this board go to, at least I do. And they are on Wednesday. So I think Thursday is a good, you know, optional extra day. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I think we're good for the night. Um, unless anybody disagrees. Uh, Ryan. Yep. So it would be Jill, the June 7th, but did you post a public hearing for June 14th? Uh, not yet. Um, there's uh, public hearings posted for June 24th. Um, I don't know. Um, oh, we, we needed to meet. Email. Sorry. I thought I got an email from you about one, uh, the, oh. the dispensary one. Maybe it was oh, a mistake. Yeah, I'll double check on that. And then um, just, just a reminder, I, yeah. I, I might be wrong, but that's what I thought. You and the, there's also, um, oh, where is it? Can we not, uh, can we just decide? We there's just also a certain. So there's also um, in the 80 state highway uh, purchase and sale, um, there are certain deadlines that we need to, um, there it is. Um, yeah, the certain deadlines that we need to meet as well. So we're gonna need a meeting. Um, actually, it looks like uh, May 31st. Um, unless we seek an ex uh, extension um, to one of the terms. Um, Whatever it is, I'll make, you know, I'll make it work. Okay. Um, so by May 30th, we have to have a review. Uh, the town has to have reviewed uh, profit and loss statements uh, for 80 State Highway. Um, and be satisfied with them. Um, that's uh, uh, clause 35 in the purchase and sale. Um, and then on <laughs> June 11th, we also have to have um, th that we have to have our basically the due diligence of the inspections of the property um, done by them. So that would 
that would work with a meeting of June 7th. Um, we have annual town meeting on Saturday the 11th. Yep. Yeah, I, that, that, that's just what the, the, con the contract that, that we've signed said. Yeah. So. Go to bed now, please. Yep. So I, with that, I'd like to move to adjourn. Helen second. Connor, aye. Barbara, aye. Michael, aye. Brian, aye. Helen, aye. I love you all. Go away now. Good night. Good night.